to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education December meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? I motion that we go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employers, or officials over whom the public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific ind individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to consult with staff, consultants, and or other individuals about pending or potential litig litigation, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations, or consider matters that relate to negotiations. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We'll now go into closed session and we'll be back at 6 p.m. Thank you. Mr. McGlashan, if you would like to start the meeting, you may. Start the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, meeting adjourned, ladies and <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And, uh, for those you might not know, I'm Scott McGlashan, your clerk of the circuit court here. Why am I shutting down? And, uh, first of all, I want to say, I was just sitting here thinking, I think it was right along through here several years ago, uh, those of you might remember the Honorable John Clark, who was district court judge here in Queen Anne's County, longest serving judge in the district court at that time. But the Board of Education and members, uh, Mr. Wright and Civil, wanted to recognize Johnny, but Johnny was very low key. He didn't, he didn't want a retirement party or anything. That was Johnny. And but Lance Richardson and several of us were invited because the board recognized his service and what he did for the Board of Education and the young people in Queen Anne's County, and he did. And John and I were sitting right along through here, and I said, I got the thing, I said, John, I said, you remember the last time you and I were in this room together? He said, and he always said, call everybody Buck. No, Buck, I don't remember that. I said, you should, it was about 1964. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we're sitting where you played basketball. That's right. And those you might not know, <laughs> this board right here gym. was the corner of the basketball court. Wow. <laughs> I remember going through that door when I graduated in 65, Locker room right around the corner. Stays was up here, and Johnny played basketball, and it was so tight that the chairs were around the, the auditorium. And you sat there, if the ball went out of bounds, you had to slide over in your seats for them to get the ball back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I just wanted to mention that old people tend to do those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> so remember Johnny Clark, he, he was great. I also want to thank you, the Board of Education, because I followed all the articles in the paper, and, and I know there's a lot of contention, political contention, and heated exchanges. Let me suggest to you, that's good. That's good. Uh, sometimes it's exasperating, but what falls out of that? One of the best educational systems in the state of Maryland, here in Queen Anne's County. So, commend you, ladies and gentlemen, for that. Is there a Carrie O'Connor in the house? <laughs> <laughs> Forward. <laughs> I would like to read uh, Governor of the State of Maryland, <coughs> Gary L. O'Connor, greetings. Having trust and confidence in your integrity, prudence, and ability, you are hereby appointed and commissioned as a member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education for a term of four years from November 1st, 2014, to execute duties in said position with fidelity and zeal for the interest and advantage of the state of Maryland. In testimony thereof, we have caused these, our letters to be made patent, the great seal of Maryland, hereby affixed. Signed, Lawrence J. Hogan, Governor of the State of Maryland. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we call the test book, T-E-S-T, and Carrie's about to attest and sign this book, which we have test books going back in the 1800s in Queen Anne's County for all those who serve our great county, Queen Anne's County. You would raise your right hand and repeat after me and serve your name after I. I? I. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie O'Connor. Do you swear or affirm? Do affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. 
That I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And that I will. And that I will. To the best of my skill and judgment. To the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully. Diligently and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice. Execute the office of. Execute the office of. Member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. Member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. According to the Constitution. According to the Constitution. And laws of this state. And laws of this state. Congratulations. Give us all Signature. Well, I'll find it again. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Oh, I asked my chief deputy, Catherine Hager, if she'll have her sign the card, which what I do with it. There it is. <laughs> Folks. The great thing about being a clerk of court is that you generally have a chief deputy clerk who keeps the clerk straight and Catherine Hedges does it. Right. Yes. I appreciate right there. that. Yes. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Madam President, the floor is yours. And the Thank floor you is yours. You <laughs> yours. I'm sorry. Uh, I, um, Would you like to say something at this time? Please do. I did write a speech and then I cut it down to a few comments. <laughs> so I can I grab those real quick? There you go. Is the mic on? Yes. Yes. Right there. Right, right there. In front of you by the computer. Hello? <laughs> I'll just, I can just project. Okay. All okay. right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here tonight. It means so much um, for my friends and family and everybody, citizens of the community to come share in this swearing in ceremony. Um, and I wrote down a few things and I'm going to share them with you right now. I'm honored to have been chosen by Governor Hogan to fill the vacancy that was created by the unfortunate passing of Arlene Taylor. It is my hope that I can honor Bishop Taylor to the best of my ability during my public service on the Board of Education for the time remaining of the term that she was elected to. I'd like to thank Governor Hogan and his administration for putting their trust in me to further serve the citizens of this county in capacity of a Board of Education member. The vacancy created is a nonpartisan position and I am most grateful to Governor Hogan for conducting a selection process that was rooted in that very notion. I'd also like to thank the Board of Education staff who have done a wonderful job of welcoming me and helping me to have many of the tools that I will need to be successful in my new position. I am looking forward to working with Dr. Kane and the executive team as well. The current board members have also reached out to me with positive messages and for that I'm most appreciative. I am a strong believer in the truth of a board being only as good as its ability to work together. I will strive to work in an atmosphere of cohesion rather than divisiveness. I have a lot of amazing friends, and for that I'm glad because their support has meant the world to me. I think they all know who they are. Last but not least, I want to thank my family, especially my father and my three daughters who are here tonight. My father has always been a source of inspiration to me through his lifelong examples of eternal optimism, love of humanity, belief in the better part of all of our natures, and the tireless efforts that he gives at giving back to his communities. My daughter, Abby, Aaron, and Riley are here tonight. I would be unable to fulfill the duties of this position as a single mom without their support. They are my heart. <laughs> Elizabeth Stone said, making the decision to have a child, it is momentous. It is to decide forever to have your heart go walking around outside of your body. I am mindful that our county has over 7,700 students, all representing each one of their parents' hearts. And I enter into this position with the promise that I will make all of my decisions knowing how much all of our students, yours and mine, mean to us. I will make every decision on this board with them in mind. And now I look forward to getting to work for this county. Thank you all and happy holidays. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to let uh, Carrie come back down, and Dr. Kane and the board members are going to come down into the audience for a little while. We have some uh, refreshments over here, so please uh, come talk to us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McGlashan. Thank you. like to call the meeting to order welcome to the December 6th Board of Education meeting this is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county <laughs> citizens to review on QAC TV a local cable station the agenda is available on the information table during this meeting we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations and comments outside the meeting room we will now stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On November 14, 2017, Governor Hogan appointed Ms. O'Connor a member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education to serve the remainder of a four-year term held by Bishop Arlene Taylor, which began on November 1, 2014 and will end on October, <clears throat> excuse me, October 31, 2018. Today, Ms. O'Connor has been properly sworn to the oath of office by the Queen Anne's County Clerk of Court. Ms. O'Connor, you are hereby seated as a member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, <laughs> Board of Education, <laughs> completing the remainder of a four-year term, which ends on October uh, 31st, 2018. Uh, we would like to welcome you as a board. <laughs> Thank welcome. you. Thank you very much. According to Section 4-102 of the Education Article, at our first meeting in December, we must elect board leadership. Instead of taking nominations from the floor, we will be electing by closed ballot. In this process, each member is given a ballot to indicate a candidate for the Office of Board President and Board Vice President. Board members, I will now entertain a motion to proceed with the election for the Office of the Board President and the Board Vice President. So moved. It is moved by Jen and second by second. second by Bev Kelly that we proceed with the election of officers. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. And at this time, we will cast our ballot. Does everyone? Do I get the yeah, there was extras. Oh, extras. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, the board person doesn't have a pencil. There you go. We will now pass their ballots to Mrs. Wright.
by way of closed ballot, Annette DiMaggio will serve as board president and Jen George as vice president for 2017. And we will now, I guess we're supposed to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the board. <laughs> thank you to all. <laughs> Would you like to say something, Ms. George? I said thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we will now proceed with our agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? <coughs> so moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Approval of the minutes, open and closed sessions, November 1st and the 15th. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from November 1st and 15th? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. And at this time, I'm going to turn the recognitions of our um, folks to our Dr. King. All right. Can we all go down front for recognitions? Okay, this is the fun part. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. This is the fun part. And so as we begin with our Energizer Bunny Award, we're going to ask our Energizer Bunny friends to come forward. And uh, we'd just like to express our appreciation for everyone tonight um, and the efforts of all who nominated and, of course, our recipients. So we'll begin with our Energizer Bunny Award, who go which goes to Mrs. Jennifer Henry, a computer lab tech manager. A computer lab manager at Sudlersville Elementary School, Ms. N Ms. Henry was nominated by Ms. Michelle McNeil. Mrs. Henry provides technology lessons to students in pre-K through grade four. This year, Ms. Henry has taken an additional responsibilities to help the school. She manages Sudlersville Elementary School's PBIS school store, and she provides volunteer training to parents on a weekly basis. She participated with Back to School Night and Title I Night to provide volunteer training for those programs. Mrs. Henry helps with the Title I parent coordinator responsibilities, uh, and with that she reaches out to parents and the community. Sudlersville <laughs> Elementary School family can rely on Mrs. Henry to offer a helping hand wherever and whenever it is needed. A question you can always hear Mrs. Henry ask is what can I do to help? That's my kind of lady. Thank you Mrs. Jennifer Henry for being the Energizer Bunny, Bunny, um, Bunny recipient at Sudlersville Elementary School. We're happy to have you as one of Queen Anne's County Public Schools finest. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, do we have, yes, we have Mr. Walsh here, yes. And anybody else from um, supporting Mrs. Henry, please come forward. Michelle. Michelle. Absolutely. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you want all of us? <laughs> <laughs> Our next award is the Shining Star Award, and the recipient is Miss Mary Jo Perticone. Am I saying that correctly? Bye. All right, come forward, please. Please come forward. Ms. Perticone is recognized as the shining star of Bayside Elementary School. She was nominated by Mrs. Nancy Grimm. Krim, is Miss Nancy in here? Is she, she, uh, is. she is the rapping <laughs> specialist. That's who she is. She's the first point of contact when people enter the school. Ms. Perticone is a ray of sunshine who is always positive and upbeat. She's constantly smiling and gracious no matter what the circumstances. 
Ms. Perdicone is, a capa is capable of handling multiple tasks at once. She's extremely patient and competent. She exemplifies great school spirit and loves to promote fun activities for the staff. Bayside Elementary School is very, very fortunate to have Ms. Perdicone, and she truly is a shining star. Our next award is the Spirit Award, and this month the Spirit Award is given to Miss Pamela Renfrom, the media specialist at Suttlersville Elementary School. Please come forward. Ms. Renfrom was nominated by the principal, Mr. Tom Walls. Ms. Renfro, am I saying that correctly? I want to make sure Renfro. I am. Renfro can always be depended upon for her enthusiasm and team spirit. Ms. And they call you Ms. Pam? Okay, Ms. Renfro, somebody wrote Ms. Pam on here. Ms. Renfro can be counted on to make the game winning play. And you must know what that means. <laughs> All right. Which always leads to a real sense of pride and dedication for everyone at the school. There's never a request that's too small or too large, especially if it means that her students, all 325 of them, will be affected in a positive way. More importantly, she does what she can with a warm smile and an I can attitude, and you can see that right now. She spearheaded uh, Sellersville Elementary School's Unity Day activities, which was very impressive and well received by students, staff, and parents. She gives personal time and resources to make the Media Center a very inviting place within the building, and even has a motivated group of fourth grade boys busting down the doors to have lunch with her while actually reading. Fabulous. She's currently planning the school-wide Polar Bear ex or Polar Express PBIS activity and she is very important member of the staff. The one who will resort to any tactic to make the school a great place to work and to play and to learn. And thanks to Ms. Renfro for all that you do for the students, family, and staff. And you are encouraged to keep up that great spirit. <laughs> And our Queen Anne's County Hero Award is given to Jameson Nisler. <laughs> Jameson is a fourth grader who attends Sellersville Elementary School. Are you a part of that reading class? Okay, but we're going to get you in there. We're going to get you in there. He was nominated by Nicole Connor. Jameson is a student who exemplifies good character in his daily interactions with others. He demonstrates kindness, inclusion of others, fairness, acceptance of others' differences, and respect toward all. Those sound like pillars for character counts to me. Are they? They are. He has shown courage in standing up for others. For example, recently, a female classmate wanted to play soccer with Jameson and a group of boys at recess time. One of the other boys told, uh, told her no, that only boys could play. And Jameson immediately stood up for her, stating that that was not true and that she could play with them if she wanted to. In other words, uh, the female student 
Jameson stood up for her. So thank you for doing that. He's really a good friend, and that is from that female student. Jameson also shows kindness and acceptance by periodically eating lunch with a classmate who does not eat in the cafeteria. <coughs> We're very lucky to have Jameson as a student and role model for others at Settlersville Elementary School. So we congratulate you, Jameson, and we are so very, very proud of you. Continue being a hero in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Thank you. <laughs> And your family is here. Come right forward. Anyone who is supporting our Jameson. I know I talked to Dad. Is Dad still here? Oh, there you are. Yep, come on up. Thank you. Yeah. We'd like to recognize that we have a county commissioner, Mr. Mark Anderson, out in their uh, audience. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. Board members, would you like to highlight any of your community involvement over the past month? Where we'd like to start? Captain Kelly? Well, I have the um, legislative committee report, and you all um, probably all received an email from MABE's Director of Government Relations, Mr. John Willems. Um, and he um, has laid out the top priorities with that the, all the boards, all the districts in the state have agreed to. Um, and I just summarize four quickly. Um, the first thing, during the General Assembly's meetings, which are start in January, the sessions, um, there are four key priorities where we kind of abide by and we agreed to. The first one is support for continued governance aut autonomy for the local boards of education so that we can set our own policies and our own budgets. Um, and that provides uh, benefits to all students and uh, we oppose all unfunded mandates. So that's one of our key priorities. Um, specifically, there we're dwelling a lot on asking uh, approval of local school calendar flexibility. You might have seen some other correspondence gone out about that. Um, the second one is support for full state funding for the Maryland school system. And specifically, we're asking for increased funding for the pre-K program. Um, well, the next one is the support for the sustained local government investments in education. Um, one was state, and now we're talking local, which is where our funding all comes from. And we're sp specifically asking that the um, assembly, General Assembly, preserve the state laws to ensure local funding in would increase um, above maintenance of effort if we can. Um, and the fourth key priority is support for um, robust state funding for school construction and school or renovation projects. Specifically, are asking for funding and process reforms that enhance local flexibility for the, that funding. So those are kind of the overriding issues that we're going to be standing by any type of legislation that comes forward. We look at it with that, the, that lens of those four key priorities. Um, and this year, I plan to brief you all on 
specific laws that are being proposed and a few at a time because it gets it's really it's hard, even hard for me to keep track of everything um, um, and and we will I will provide you input on uh, Mabe's input to the delegate decision process basically I'll try to keep it brief as I can so we don't go too crazy about it but I think you should be more informed and it's easier than looking on through all this stuff and trying to read it um, um, and a few that may come forward just generally the things that are, we think are going to be looked at for legislation there's a lot of them um, but overall testing and curriculum school choice and public funding for non-public schools charter schools special ed school safety and security student discipline student health nutrition and fitness employee relations and collective bargaining federal education funding and policy and the discussion or some laws may come forward on the elected hybrid or appointed boards of education now, i don't guarantee that the laws are going to be be coming forward for all of those issues but that's what the um government people that work in MAVE are seeing popping up here and there before the assembly starts. So I'll do my best to keep you all informed and the public informed as, as best I can till so you know better this year, since I'm getting more of a hang of it, of what's going on with your uh, school system. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, I had a fairly busy month. I attended MAVE Open Meeting Act training it's a wonderful program even for the general layperson. I was so impressed in the way they pre presented it to us so that it was very understandable. Captain Kelly attended with me. And it gives us a much better understanding of why these laws exist, how important they are to follow. And, you know, in the event that you have an error, how you go about fixing it, because you can. Um, so I was very appreciative to be able to, to attend that and also I was appointed to the May Budget Committee and we had our meeting in January, in, I'm sorry, we had our meeting this month. Um, we adopted a budget that goes to the directors and if they approve it then this is our May Budget for the year. Another great learning process for me, our county commissioners can attest to the fact that I'm usually sitting in their wings watching their budget proceedings. Um, I'm real interested in how our taxpayer dollars are spent by all organizations and we all strive to do the best we can for all of you. Um, I was able to attend the Sunday Supper on Ken Island this time at Christ Church and that is always a very informative program because it changes up every single time you go. Um, now they're working towards building their committees and going out into the community and doing some of the work that we've laid the groundwork for during the Sunday suppers. I attended the, the um, Canard Alumni Gala, which was so interesting for me because we have so many um, alumni at the Canard old high school who graduated, went off to college, and came back to Queen Anne's County to be educators. So I'm always in awe in this room with all the educators and the administrative um, staff that we have that attend our meetings. But in a personal kind of social setting, I don't always have that opportunity. And it's really so heartwarming because they still have that passion. And they still love it when we remember that they they taught our children or they taught us. So that was a really nice event for me to attend at the Canard Museum. Um, Ms. O'Connor attended with me and she'll put in her, her feelings about it. Um, and then I was a grandmother again this mm -hmm. week. Yes. For the fifth time, we have Kaylee Grace in our family now. And um, I was fortunate enough to keep my grandson all week so I could take him to Kennard because he actually lives in Anne Arundel County, but we fortunately have the ability to have him educated here, which is delightful for me. And I felt like super grandma. All you moms that go and get your kids <laughs> at school are super moms. I felt like super grandma last week. <laughs> you know, bath time and pickup time and standing <clears throat> in line just like everybody else and seeing how those schools flow them in and flow them out. Sign your name, don't have your ID, got to go back to your car. <laughs> everybody <laughs> figures it out really quickly. So I appreciate our security for our students and for our staff and just have nothing negative to say about any of this. And I wouldn't <laughs> if I did. <laughs> Um, I was fortunate enough to um, attend and be a part of the Make a Difference Day at the Sellersville Middle School on the 4th of November. 
uh, this is the fourth year, and what a wonderful program for air needy and couch surfing folks. Uh, we had over, I think, 20 some uh, vendors that came. So that's a great thing that we do. Um, I attended North Bay one day on the 15th. Um, what an experience. If you've never been to North Bay or if you do not know where North Bay is, it is in Northeast and it is it's part of Elk Neck um, Preservation up there and it is beautiful. The kids were having an awesome time while I was there and um, it's, it's always a highlight to be able to spend the day with the kids even though <laughs> I took a hike. I said, the kids said it was a mile. I said it was 500 because <laughs> it certainly did feel like it. So um, that was my, um, my so, Ms. George? Yep. Um, to tag on to North Bay, I was up there for an entire week, 24-7. Um, 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 it was a very nice experience. If North Bay, if, if the public doesn't know, is our sixth grade goes and attends an outdoor education program for an entire week where they spend the night and um, have educators in the day, counselors in the evening. They have a lot of fun um, activities. Uh, a lot, it's, it's high energy, <laughs> high energy. Um, and and it, it, it's definitely a positive experience for our youth in the county. Uh, I also um, attended the Christmas parade, and even though it was December. <laughs> Um, I did that too. Mostly as a parent, then as a board parent, uh, board member. I, my son's in the band, so if I'm on the float, I can't support him in his band. So I, I always opt out to stand on the sidelines and clap for the band. Um, so other than that, I'm looking forward to the upcoming Christmas concerts and um, choral uh, concerts that are coming up. So that's that's pretty much what's keeping me busy. Um. I was uh, fortunate enough to attend the Kennard Elementary Alumni Association Gala. Um, Ms. Harlow was there. And it was held at the, I'm, I'm going to botch this name, the Queen Anne's County African American History Museum. Is that right? Heritage. Yes. Heritage Center. Mm -hmm. Heritage. Okay. Mm -hmm. I should know it because it's um, just a block from my house and I walk there all the time. And so I've seen the progression of the building from the outside. Um, and it was lovely to be able to see what they've done to the inside. It's amazing. So that was wonderful. Um, I did attend the Sunday supper a few days later, and that was great also because I'm on the local management board and had been hearing from the Multicultural Proficiency uh, Committee all these months about the progression that they've made with these Sunday suppers. So I was so fortunate to finally be able to attend, um, and that was great. Um, uh, my daughter's on the basketball team for the middle school, so I've been to um, two games so far. She's an alternate, so she just rides the, the bench, but it's great to get there and <laughs> see her sitting there watching the plays so she can hopefully, you know, know what to do next year. <laughs> um, uh, oh, Franklin Institute. I went with the seventh grade to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia the day we had the fog delay. And so the trip proceeded in spite, despite the fog delay, and it was great. I was in awe over how well behaved the students were from that middle school. Um, I haven't chaperoned that many field trips, um, the middle school age, and so to see some of the other schools and then to see ours, I was very proud. Um, and that's it for me. Dr. King. Dr. King. All right, so it's been a busy time since last we met. Uh, my team and I, Mr. P and uh, Ms. Peluski and uh, Ms. Pauls, we've been out to schools doing school monitoring visits, which you'll hear a little bit about uh, tonight. We've been meeting with principals for their SLO conferences. It's been great. Um, had an opportunity to go to the Kent Island High School Fall Athletic Awards, and that was a fabulous program where they honored uh, students who are athletes and scholars, and that was very, very impressive. Um, right before the Thanksgiving break, I have my 
first superintendent's art gallery, and it was fabulous. We met so many wonderful families and celebrated the art that the students produced and how they are passionate about the arts. And, and we're going to do more to bolst, bolster our arts program. And I uh, had an opportunity to speak with Mr. Clayton Washington uh, with regard to some, some ideas for using that, that center. We've got to fill it up with students. We've got some ideas. Um, also, at the Sunday supper, and didn't realize it at the time, but I happened to be sitting right next to <laughs> Ms. O'Connor, right. and we had a conversation, and we neither of us knew that right. you were going to be appointed at that time, right. but it was great uh, to do that. Um, met with some wonderful folks over at Washington College, Dr. Bunton and Dr. Hunter. They each run um, professional development school programs and enrollment uh, management. Mr. Pender, Mr. Jack of all trades Pender, uh, and Ms. Carla, Carla Pullen, our facilities planner, we met with, um, or we did a short presentation for the uh, county commissioners for which Mr. Anderson definitely was there to present our uh, fiscal year 19 capital improvement plan um, request. And uh, we, it, was, it was good to be there. We were also able to celebrate uh, character counts. So we were able to uh, be there to recognize Mr. Fred Sheriff, who is the coach of the year for Churchill Elementary School. So that was a pleasure. And at the same time, they were celebrating their 17th year anniversary. So lots of great things happening at that time. And also just wanted to recognize, in addition to Mr. Anderson, uh, Mr. Jack Wilson, who is also a Character Counts coach for Sutlersville Elementary School. Uh, so I'd just like to personally or publicly thank all of those who are involved with those programs um, and for uh, certainly for our commissioners and our school board members who support those programs programs in our communities. It's just a great way to, uh, to build the positives for, for what we do, just like we celebrated young Jameson tonight for the things that he does. Uh, met with Chester Y leaders and looking forward to an opportunity to collaborate with Character Counts and Chester Y and, and do some things to support our, our families with uh, family members who have special needs. So that'll be exciting. Great news there. Uh, Mr. Ingalls, myself, um, Mike Clark from the Local Management Board and, and Joe Gravis from the um, Department of Juvenile Services were working to, uh, and Mr. P working to build a new evening high school um, program. So that will definitely be, you'll hear more about that in the coming months. And um, had a chance to participate a bit in the Title I Parent Advisory Meeting that was led by Ms. Susan Walbert. It was great meeting our uh, families that participate there. We had many administrators and school staff there as well. And of course, on last Friday, had an opportunity to do my very first Centerville <laughs> Christmas Parade, riding on the back of the pick em up truck from Miss uh, DiMaggio here. It was a great night. Uh, Miss Pauls was there, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Maluski, uh, Miss DiMaggio, and, and her fabulous husband did the driving for us that night. And we also had Miss Marsha McNeil, our Teacher of the Year. So it was just a great night. Yes, it was. It's been uh, very, very busy, but lots of good things going on we'll certainly continue to share more as we as we continue any of my exec team folks want to share anything I, I probably took all of them I'm sorry if I could just share one thing uh, earlier uh, upon uh, Dr. Kane's arrival she had met with the leadership at Dixon Valve uh, in Chestertown and I had an opportunity on Friday to follow up on that and I had a great tour at Dixon Valve and we want to build a strong partnership uh, we talked about internships. We talked about work-based learning opportunities. Uh, we talked about our early college academy uh, with the community college and how they could get involved. And one of the things that they also offered is they have a leadership with integrity course that they invite high school students in. Uh, so we're going to be sending 25 students from Queen Anne's County High School and Ken Island High School uh, to participate that they put on the leadership series. They get a chance to interact with their international business uh, leaders. I think it was just a great opportunity. So I wanted to follow up on the initial superintendent's visit and as we'll create a, a stronger uh, pipeline with one of many partners. Thank you, Mr. P. At this time, we'll move on with our student board members. Um, this month, we'll start with Sarah, <laughs> Queen Anne's County High School. Hello. Um, I'd like to start with apologizing for being absent from the last meeting. I was attending a rehearsal for The Crucible. That was my first play production. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I hope that 
other children in my school get involved with the program because it was amazing. Um, the nursing program at my high school will be taking part in a diaper and wipe drive for the Healthy Families program until December 20th. They ask that all diapers are sizes 1 to 5, that the wipes are unscented, and that donations are given to Queen Anne's High School, room 311. Queen Anne's will be hosting the, their annual holiday dance concert December 13th at 7 p.m. Admission is $3 or an unwrapped toy to donate to Toys for Tots. Ms. Tyler, the dance director, loves to do that every year. Mr. Callahan, the director of Queen Anne's Theater Department, is pleased to announce Susical the Musical as the Spring Musical of 2018. The musical will take place at 7.30 on March 2nd, 3rd, and 10th, and at 3 o'clock on March 11th. Admission is 10 for adults and 7 for students and seniors. We hope to see you there. Finally, PSAT scores of October 11th, 2017 are expected, expected to be released to students in school between December 11th and 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Grace? Okay, so at Ken Island High School, auditions for our school's musical, The Music Man, are complete and rehearsals have started this week along with our winter sports season. Our band performed at parades in Centerville and Cambridge this weekend and our choir left today to go to Disney World to perform. Um, today there was also a career cafe for students interested in environmental science where three professionals in the field spoke with students about potential careers. There will be a dance showcase on December 13th at 7 p.m. and a band concert on December 20th at 7 p.m. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, at this time, Sharon. Um, we invite our public to join us with any public comments that they might have. We ask that you sign the roster at the door or give me your name and your address and phone number. Comments should be limited to two min minutes in, le in length, and they should be submitted in writing if they're any longer than that. If there's a question involved, a staff member will appropriately answer you in a short period of time. Questions or statements to the board related to re recent agenda items um, or an agenda item that's expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority are areas that our questions are statements should relate to. It is not a proper avenue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on a legal appeal to the board, comments about the actions of state comments and about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through available channels. Citizens participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds you, to you in an appropriate manner, time of time frame. Um, the board respects your desire to re your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to the board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. We have uh, Mr. Richard McNeil signed up for to, uh, to make our first comments. God, you guys move my chair. Mrs. Good evening, Richard McNeil, and uh, I'm still president of the Retired Educators Group, and it looks like I might be elected next year, so uh, I'm advertising for anybody who wants to retire and run for that office, uh, <laughs> join us. Um, on behalf of the Retired Educators Group, I want to uh, welcome uh, Ms. O'Connor to, to the group, and I have a card so that you know when we meet and so forth. And um, as I said before, uh, we do have uh, four luncheons, and it is an open invitation if you just let uh, Jackie know the Thursday before those meetings uh, so we can account for that. Uh, you're welcome to join us. And Captain Kelly, I think I just got word that you're going to join us good on December. I'd like to introduce and just share with you uh, Margie. She is a retired group, and she's going to share just a few minutes of uh, what she did here. Um, my name is Marge Felchy, and I retired eight years ago after 33 years of teaching. The last 23 years were here in Queen Anne's County at Graysonville and at Settlersville Elementary. Um, after I retired, I tutored, and I currently volunteer and have continued to volunteer in a class in a class at Settlersville in first grade with a friend every week. Um, I've been active in the Retired Teachers Organization since I retired and for the past three years I've been the secretary. Uh, as a group and individually, the retired educators in this county continue to support the children and I wanted to thank you for recognizing the valuable contributions of those individuals in the county 
for what they've done in the past and what they continue to do today. And along the same lines, I know that uh, the budget process is underway. We want to thank the board for their continued support of our health care package. Um, as, as we get older and retire, you know, health care becomes a very expensive uh, deal. And we do appreciate uh, the support that the board has, has done and hopefully will continue to do that. Um, one of the things that I'd um, like to mention, the Hope School that's out on the um, property of Queen Anne's County High School, which was a one-room one schoolhouse uh, for the Afro-American students from the 1860s right on up through 19, I think it was 37, the last time it was used. Um, I will be meeting with uh, the, the retired educators group kind of oversee that to a certain extent. I'm going to be meeting with a grant writer for uh, that works with the national, I mean the uh, local historical society about a possible matching grant um, to do some re needed repairs to keep that building going. Um, might be asking the board if they could think of a possible contribution between eight and a eight hundred and a thousand dollars, so that we can match that to double it. Uh, I'd hate to see the uh, school go into repair where it literally would fall apart, since it is a part of the uh, school system and the heritage of Queen Anne's County. Um, I know many of you probably have never seen the inside of that. Um, it's it's well preserved it's put together well it's got the desks in there it's got textbooks from the 1890s right on up to the 1930s and it's also got the original land grant that a farmer gave to the school system uh, to provide space for that school so it has the history to that aspect um, so I put that out now so that if there's a possibility that we could match that grant the retired educators group have really no way of making, uh, generating money uh, to do that. Uh, and I just put that out and said maybe you can, we'll talk later about sure. some things. Um, on, a, on a totally different note, I'm, I oversee and monitor the life skills program uh, through that uh, uh, Michael uh, sees in, in the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder. It's their program. And it's about making decisions that children have to be faced with. And it's a, last year was a sixth grade program. This year it's a sixth and seventh grade program. Uh, Christine does a wonderful job of presenting that. Um, and again, I, I encourage you to, to become a little bit more aware of what that is. I think it's great. I, I get to see the children participating in that is really active, involved. Uh, if you have the opportunity to sit in on one of those classes, uh, she is not a trained teacher, but she does a great job of teaching the kids and guiding them through the program. And I think it's just something that this county uh, needs for our children because of all the decisions that they're faced with, both in school and out of school. And it's just not a drug program, and it's just not an anti-smoking program. It's, uh, it's everything combined, but it's about making good decisions in life. And you know, it's been great to see the sixth graders go through that. Uh, I'm anxious to see how the seventh graders pick up since they were through it last year. Seventh grade program will start in the um, in January going through. So I just put that plug in as a that's another hat, not not the retired hat on that aspect. Uh, it was great to see the folks in the parade. Um, it was good. Uh, I was waving and cheering, and you were busy waving and cheering, so we had a good time. So thank you very much. Thank you. The next name on our list is David Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Kane, executive team. Uh, my name is David Brown. I reside in Chester Harbor. Uh, I am the father of three Queen Anne's County graduates and the grandfather of a current Queen Anne's County student. As we approach the upcoming budget season, I would like to take a moment to request that the board consider re-implementing the facilitator of digital teaching and learning position that was formerly held by Mrs. Christina Schindler. Queen Anne's County currently has more than 2,300 laptops and 3,600 uh, Chromebooks in students' hands. 
with additional laptops and carts and additional desktop computers in labs and in classrooms around the county. Beyond the student devices, each teacher has a laptop and most have access to digital devices such as interactive whiteboards, LCD projectors, and document cameras. These tools represent a huge investment made by the school system in technology. With all these devices and tools in the hands of students and educators, we currently have absolutely no one whose responsibility it is for overseeing the use of these tools and helping teachers use them effectively with students. If the school system is going, going to get any return on its investment in technology, it must provide support for students and teachers with these tools. The facilitator of digital teaching and learning position is the answer to this. Please, as you address the budget in the upcoming year, please consider re-implementing this position and I would highly recommend putting Mrs. Schindler back into that position where she has done so many great things that happen in Queen Anne's County. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Mark? Oh, sorry, Linda, I didn't see you. It's up to Mark. Ladies first or our dignitaries first? It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> You're both equally important. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Linda Friday, President of the Queen Anne County Chamber, and I'd like to congratulate uh, Ms. O'Connor on her recent appointment. Um, one of the things, I wasn't going to speak, but I just want to share with the board, I think it's important for you to know, uh, the Chamber actually oversees the Adopt a Bear program, and I'm sure that all of you are aware of that program. Uh, this year we had 986 students in the program. Every one of them was adopted. Um, we had... Um, Bay Area Association of Realtors, they actually adopted 550 of those students. Um, and then the rest was, uh, was done by the community and the business community. So I just think it's, it's important to thank uh, the community as a whole for all that was done for that program. Also your counselors in the school system, I can't say enough about them. It's fabulous what they've done. Uh, we try to respect the privacy of all students. Um, we're very careful with that program because we know the importance. So I just think it's important that you know that it's very successful. It's 27 years old that we've been servicing this community um, with the adopt a bear program. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping next year we can continue with that, which I'm sure we'll be able to do that. Um, and I think Monday or Tuesday is when everything Santa delivers. Um, so I know Sudlersville um, gets, I think all of their things go to the fire department. So um, I, I think it's important for us as a community to come together to support that program. And we do it throughout the entire year. It's not just a one-time thing. So it's just something that people aren't aware of that happens. Um, and I think it's important to know um, you as as the leaders of our school system to know that this community is very giving to our children. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of, of what has happened this year. Um, we probably could have adopted another 100 if we wanted to, but uh, the people this year were very giving. So Good. thank you to your counselors and please share that with them. Uh, that it was just, it was fabulous. I have a question, mm -hmm. and Linda, I don't know if it's appropriate for you or Dr. Kane. Am I correct answer. in the understanding that Adopt a Bear does service all of our um, free lunch students? Yes. I think yeah. many people don't know that. Yeah. So, so what <clears throat> what we do is we send a letter to, actually your counselors are already prepared. So every child that's in the free lunch program um, is eligible to participate. Right. I will tell you we have had some families um, in North County that have come forward. Um, we have almost 500 children from Sudlersville area that have been adopted. Um, so it's a huge support in the Sudlersville area. But we have had some unusual circumstances where we've been able to help um, those families that um, maybe didn't qualify or they missed or they need a little extra. So um, because it was so supported this year, we were able to reach out to those families. So if you have a family or if there's a family out there that feels that they need to reach out, they can contact the chamber um, and we will put them in touch with the appropriate person. Um, also, I'd like to thank KRM Development because they are the ones that actually house the whole program for us, which is another huge 
generous donation of, of just the space because um, it's a huge <coughs> process. And I would invite all of you to go out and at least visit the center. You will be amazed at the process of this whole thing. I understand the wrapping party was at the business park this morning. We don't do wrapping. Oh, you didn't? No, we don't do wrapping. We okay. haven't wrapped Maybe in Maybe it years. was organization. We organize. Um, every child is given a skew, so there's no Excuse names. Um, okay. They're all given skews just to protect um, their privacy. Okay. So anyway, I just want to give a report and thank you. I appreciate Please that thank your counselors. Thanks. Thank so, you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. And just as a, we thank you, Ms. Friday, and um, thank you to Dr. Pearson who organized the Adopt a Bear here for Central Office folks to give as well. Thank you. And Mark Anderson, our county commissioner representing District 4 and the county. unusual to be sitting on this side of uh, the dais. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the county commissioners, we'd like to welcome Carrie Lee O'Connor uh, to this board. Uh, she is uh, going to be very active, and I wanted to specifically thank her three daughters for loaning her skills for the basis of, or the, uh, the fundamental amount of all the students and children of this county, so welcome. Uh, I'd be very m remiss in not mentioning uh, an additional welcome to Dr. Andrea Kane. We uh, had occasion to, to meet at Kennard and then set up a meeting. It was supposed to last 15 minutes <laughs> and 90 minutes later, <laughs> after we found all the trails that had crossed back and forth from Baltimore City and uh, Anne Arundel, uh, what a wonderful addition uh, to our school system. Thank you. Uh, one last comment, uh, and that is, let's not forget vocational education. Queen Anne's County, sort of in the forefront of something that's been forgotten when I used to go to high school and pass Mergenthaler Vocational School. It's not a shameful thing for children to learn uh, how to use a God-given skill, uh, and that being uh, fixing an engine, nursing, uh, doing something that they can immediately go to work and earn a living. Uh, it's a good thing. And uh, I know our uh, kids that like vocational education and want to pursue that uh, have a wonderful outlet in this county because of the people sitting uh, in front of me. Uh, we need to do more. Uh, marrying it up with uh, our uh, community college has been an exceptional partnership and I think it needs to continue. One last thought, we get a lot of attention on this opioid uh, epidemic and a lot of attention is paid to the middle schools. I think there are gotta be some age appropriate introductions starting <clears throat> in the first grade. And if we can come up with an acceptable program, I'll do what I can to get the governor to give us money for it. Thank you. It, we need to get in some way little exposure. Uh, by the time they're six, seven years old, they're primed to learn this. By the time they get into the seventh grade, they already learned something and it, they didn't learn it from the right source. Um, the anti-bullying uh, is another a fabulous thing that uh, is driven. Uh, the text to stop it unbelievably great program and we need to do all we can to keep that going. I was surprised to find out when it started <coughs> every one of our high schools had some form of drug use and abuse. That's been dealt with because of the text to stop it. There were eight potential suicides that were averted because intervention was able to come because text to stop it. This all comes from a combination of elected officials, school board members, but the community as a whole, and people that are willing to volunteer to help. And for all those people, I wish a very happy holiday, and Merry Christmas, <laughs> and we will go no further. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Kane to introduce the presentations. All right, so we'll begin with a brief presentation to update you all on uh, our superintendent school monitoring visit. So I'll ask Mr. Paluski and Ms. Pauls to come forward.
keep it moving. Okay, so thank you again for um, hearing us. We are here and already introduced to talk a little bit about our superintendent monitoring visits. I mentioned a bit about that earlier when we talked about our community <laughs> activities, and we have been to all of the schools, and we've also visited um, APA, Anchor Points Academy, to ensure that we are um, offering some feedback to schools with regard to their progress toward meeting their instructional goals as well as how those instructional goals uh, interpret themselves into performance performance for students and performance for staff. So the purpose of this is just to make sure that you are updated, you are um, kept up to date with regard to what we're doing, um, the philosophy that we are continuing to look at our data through a lens of equity, and I will always remind you of our deep, deep belief that every single student can and must achieve to his or her highest potential. So those things are the reason why we're sharing this work with you. Uh, we're going to align and we're going to collect the uh, connect the work of schools with recommendations from the curriculum management audit. So there is always that continuous connection to show our progress for continuous school improvement. Uh, or improvement in teaching and learning. So thank you for listening. Um, so our objectives for that monitoring visit is certainly to review data. It's a three-part, really, uh, um, visit. The first part of the visit is reviewing the school's data, and they sort of um, populate um, data charts and a school site that asks for information pertaining to their school improvement plan. We look at attendance for not only students, but we look at attendance for our staff. We look at um, observations data. We look at all types of student performance data just to ensure that we're getting a pretty complete picture with regard to how students and staff are progressing as well as an understanding of our gaps in student learning as well as performance of our staff and uh, we conduct school or classroom visits so first thing we do is we do the data review and then we conduct classroom visits so the leadership team um, creates a schedule for us and and we go around and we do some observations and then we come back and we engage in a dialogue with the leadership team and they speak with us about their data we speak about some of the things that we saw during our observations and any other time that we've been there anything that we might need to bring up and we talk about their progress in using the data wise improvement process and that's a way to look at the data and data not being just numbers but all the information information together that really tells the story of what's happening at a school and the steps that we take to move a school forward. So schools are in different places. We'll continue to do professional development with um, terms in terms of our data-wise improvement process, but in general, I am happy to say that schools are moving forward. We have some of the most dedicated educators I have had the pleasure of working with in my life, and I am just glad to be here. I'm glad that we're implementing this process. Mr. Paluski and Ms. Paul began this process last year. We made some changes that I believe are, are um, serving us well, and I will at this point turn it over to them. I'll stop talking so that they can tell you about the structure and exactly what it is that we found. I can keep going. All right. So, yeah, I, I can talk all night, but I won't do that to you. So, uh, we had the on site monitoring visits for all 14 schools and APA, mentioned that already. And basically, you're looking at the three core team members, but we had um, supervisors from curriculum and instruction to uh, work with us. And um, and visit the schools and do observations and that was very um, important because they are in schools every day and they are in schools doing walkthroughs for their content areas working closely with teachers all of those things are key to our visit so it's not just a uh, a small view but we're looking at a very wide perspective as we visit schools um, we take uh, we're going to have two on-site visits we did the fall ones we're already gearing up to do the ones that will happen in the winter and each principal and school leadership team provided various components as I mentioned earlier for the data walkthrough for the classroom um, <coughs> observations and the data wise improvement process presentation so now we're going to briefly walk you through some of those components and if you have some additional questions we'd be happy to entertain them we don't want to go into each one in depth so we started out with the school improvement site because everything that we've done has been aligned with the school improvement um, part of what our schools are doing. 
Whoa. There go. Talk through it. It's probably because a different computer. Just talk through it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually the school improvement process began um, in the summer for each of the schools. And so we're just continuing that as we conduct our, our monitoring visits. One of the things, key things that they did, as Dr. Kane alluded to, was they <coughs> gathered all kinds of data. There were about 10 different forms of data that was collected. And one thing that we had not done before in our monitoring visits from last year was to look at some of the attendance data. And there were really a lot of ahas from each of the principals as to what that data revealed regarding students, regarding um, staff members. Also, we looked at um, the, um, we also looked at uh, discipline yeah, discipline data was something that we had not spent too much time on before. But there were 10 major components. We looked at SLO data. We looked at um, walkthroughs, learning walkthroughs, observation tools, lots and lots and lots of data. Um, again, even those schools that required a lot of work for the schools, they were happy with the ahas that were revealed as a part of the data analysis. And then the next part of the presentation was actually doing a walkthrough. We walked through the schools, and again, um, I'd like to, again, agree with what Dr. Kane has said. We saw some exemplary instruction. Our teachers are working really hard, but we saw some great students as well, too. Having the opportunity to, to interact with the students and to talk about what are you learning today and why are you learning this, and students would give us uh, a dissertation on what they were learning and why it was a critical piece of what they were learning. So we had some excellent opportunities to interact with our students as well as our staff members as well. And then the day, uh, each of the principals had a data presentation that they had prepared. And many of the specialists were involved in this piece of the presentation as well because it was a collective effort from the school teams. And they shared their data once again. And this is where they really honed in on the data-wise process. And I have been in the county for many years. And for many of those years, we would identify many reasons why we felt our data was moving or wasn't moving and what our strengths was but one of what our strengths were but one of the major things that data wise helped us to do was to isolate it to one specific question and it was difficult for schools to do but it was an excellent process and the questions that they came up were really very decisive and pointed questions and help to focus their their lens for instruction and further data collection so it was excellent it really was excellent to see how they drilled down to that level and the data wise process has been ex an exemplary process for uh, our schools and then there was an opportunity to ask some reflective questions. Um, Mr. Paluski had prepared some questions, but then the conversation directed us to some different points for some different questions. And we posed some of the questions and schools were able to ask some of those questions as well. And then the last piece of that was to provide feedback to each of the schools. And it's a very detailed feedback as to what the strengths and the weaknesses are and our observation points, what the, what the key questions were uh, during our visit. So the data is really very comprehensive for schools to be able to use to move forward. Some of the emerging themes that we found were, and we've Actually, we didn't have a question. Um, how did you pick the students or did the principal pick the students that you <coughs> talked to or was it arbitrary? It was arbitrary. Okay. We just walked in the classroom. Students were involved in their everyday lessons. Just like if you were to go and you know visit a classroom and we would just ask what are you working on mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about your writing what about the story that you're reading um, you know help me to understand the assignment that you're working on very arbitrary yes. same thing about the staff um, when you're when you're actually discussing the bring it down to the key question who, who participated in that was that from the principals or yeah that was a process and most of that was through the school improvement team Okay. And some of it was through leadership teams. Each of, the, each of them actually had a different lens that they were looking for, mm -hmm. and they had some choice in how they wanted to, to work through the data-wise process. Most was the school improvement team. Others was the data-wise process. But it was a collective effort at every school. It just may have been different players. 
and, and the two are married. So whether we're talking about the school improvement plan and that team, or we're talking about a team that's talking about the data for data-wise, it's the same data. So one of the questions or the main question is about what is the learner-centered problem? And so they are deciphering through lots of data to look at gaps and what is it? What's a root cause of an issue that's creating a learner-centered problem? And so some schools were able to identify one and some schools are saying, well, we just aren't there yet, and so we talk through the process and what they ought to, the types of questions they ought to be asking to gather that information. So it, it's it is it's an in-depth process, and we're in different places with it, but it is definitely uh, one that's worth uh, the time and effort. But at, in every school, it was led by the the principal. Okay. So many, many strengths, but we just highlighted a few of those strengths. And again, um, we talked about the great staff um, that we have in the schools and central office here and our commitment to continuing to improve the teaching and learning in our schools. The climate and the culture was, was just in every school was very positive um, atmosphere in, in every school through observations and conversations. And also during that time, Dr. Kane was um, giving some commendations to our principals because it was National Principals Month and we had and she had the opportunity to also talk to some parents during that time as well. So it really was a great time to talk to the entire group of <coughs> stakeholders. Um, again, the leadership team had the opportunity to look at a variety of data using a variety of tools. Uh, we looked at one of our really focal points for this year is the communication of daily student learning objectives and we'll see that as a strength and as an area that we need to grow in. Teachers are making great process with that, uh, progress with that, um, but we, it's an area that we'll continue to work on. They are communicating that to students, so students are in turn able to tell us what it is that they are learning. Um, we talked about the data-wise process and how it is at various stages uh, of implementation, but it is going extremely well. And as a result of all of this professional development and visits to school, we're continuing to refine our curriculum documents and make sure that they are uh, <coughs> accessible for teachers to use. And then we are doing lots of professional development. And we saw technology in every school that we visited. Uh, and it was used by students at all levels. So it really was great visits to every school. So some of the challenges that we found uh, to balance that, so there are so many great things that are going on uh, in Queenians County Public Schools. And as you know, you've looked at our uh, we've shared our park data with you on our indicators and although when you look at the aggregate uh, we rank very high however when you start to dissect that there are still significant achievement gaps uh, with particular uh, specifically with special education students african-american ell and farm students and uh, i will tell you uh, with my colleagues as well when we've engaged schools in these conversations they are targeting the gaps and they're very focused on that uh, the superintendent has made that very clear uh, from day one uh, and that still remains a challenge for us and that still remains moving forward that we continue that focus uh, embracing the philosophy uh, of equity uh, is still an area that we need to do a lot of work in. Uh, whether that's leadership practices or instructional practices within the classroom, that has to remain a continual focus moving forward because that will make a significant difference in closing individual gaps for students. Uh, there are inequities, uh, there are inconsistencies uh, among schools that we certainly found as well, uh, whether on our visits or observations. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, specifically about, about that on, on the second slide. Uh, as Ms. Pauls had mentioned that we had a system-wide focus on our classroom outcomes or objectives. Uh, it still remains. Uh, in some cases, we're not teaching to the level of the rigor of the what the standard is calling for. So we recognize that we have to do more professional development. We're, we're making progress, but aligning what we ask students what they need to know and be able to do, how are they gonna do that, and why are they learning, still continues to be a focus. We believe this is a small shift that will create dividends down the road as we continue to focus on individual gaps. Uh, the effective use of instructional time is still a challenge. Uh, schools are using time differently. Uh, you'll also notice in these challenges, 
uh, echo some of the challenges outlined in the curriculum management audit. So we recognize in school scheduling is one area that we have to really take a look at uh, when it comes to some inequities. We spent a lot of time with schools talking about their interventions. Uh, you'll notice that was also uh, picked up in the curriculum management audit. You'll hear a theme in the Innovation Center on some of the work that they're doing to look at the interventions that we're offering, the students that are in them. Uh, our students making progress, that still remains a challenge. Uh, our professional development around culturally relevant <coughs> teaching strategies is an area that has to remain a focus moving forward. Uh, how we're monitoring instruction from building to building varies. Uh, there can be a different expectation from school to school on what it is that they're looking at. So you'll see some, some parallel themes of the work that's going on in the Innovation Center to address some of these challenges. Excuse me. I'm a little happy on the... <laughs> on the trigger. Uh, as the superintendent uh, mentioned, this is part of our systemic improvement process. So we have finished phase one. Uh, we'll move into phase two in the month of February. We will go back out as well as with our uh, curriculum supervisors and we'll go into round two. Uh, we're still formulating what that actually is going to look like. We'll meet with our ANS teams next week. But this will continue to be the second revolution if you will, of our improvement process of monitoring from a system level. Uh, we'll use that, continue to monitor the performance. We'll use this information uh, to target specific professional development for principals, for teachers, for support staff as well. And then we'll use this to be able to analyze and really monitor our visits to really look at those inclusive practices. And this gets back to Dr. Kane's uh, emphasis on equity and, and looking at leadership practices and teacher practices that <coughs> influence student practice. Finally, with all this in our cycle, as Ms. Pauls had mentioned, our June Leadership Institute is focused on school improvement. So all these two pieces will fit into the work that we'll do uh, when schools get their data in June, and we use that as a platform to plan and professional development for the upcoming school year so that they can <laughs> tightly align their school improvement plans with their areas of need. Uh, we'll continue to utilize the structure of the Innovation Center to move initiatives towards these challenges forward, and we'll continue to align the educational programs and those resources uh, with the district's vision and goals, and I think you'll see tonight a lot of parallels and similarities uh, to some of the themes that we've presented to you this evening. And with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Yes, I have um, three questions on it. Um, and, and this might be where you're moving into phase two, Mr. Paluski. Um, I was wondering how, like, are you looking at ways to shift these structural and leadership practices to embrace philosophy that our professional practices are guided through a lens of equity? It's, it's really hard to figure out how you can do that. So I'll give you, if I might, I, I can give you a uh, real life example. <laughs> So in the past, and, and Queen Anne's County has been known for high performance, right? High performance overall. But when you dig closer in that data, when you dig a bit deeper, you'll see the gaps. In one of our schools, uh, in digging deeper and really looking for the gaps, the leadership team found about seven, a 70-point <coughs> gap between the overall, yeah, 70. Uh, between the overall student group, which you would say this is a high-performing school, and one of the student groups. That type of gap should not exist. So what that principal did, in addition to the leadership team coming together to think about what strategies they might use to engage students differently, what professional development they can offer teachers and their administra administrative team, this uh, principal decided to base his uh, SLO on this gap because it's that significant and it is that important to embrace the philosophy of every student, not just the ones that perform here, not just the ones who come from more affluent families, but for every student to meet his highest. Now this student, say everybody's scoring in the 90s, maybe the student's potential isn't in the 90s, maybe the student's potential is in the 70s, but if he's, if he's performing in the 20s and the 30s, he isn't there yet. So we've got to do what we have to do to get that student to reach his highest potential. 
So that's a real life <coughs> example of embracing the philosophy of equity. Every single student gets what he or she needs, not what everybody else is getting. And that's, that's great. I don't know how they figured that out. <laughs> but the, the big thing, the other thing that follows on to that is, I think one thing we have to be careful of, and it's not just, it probably just marketing. There is a concern from the ones up here that to bring this one to that level is going to be forcing this one to come lower. And that's kind of the public concern. And, and that is, you say marketing, but yeah, that is really helping everyone to understand uh, what equity is really about. And in our ANS meetings, I keep bringing back a slide that says we're going to keep talking about equity. We're going to keep talking about it because it is true. Some people do not, this is, it's 2017, but it's not uh, common for some folks to think this way um, and to help others understand that their child or a certain group of high performing students will not, will not be disadvantaged because of the effort to bring another group of students to their high, highest potential. That's learning. That, that is work that we have to do and we'll continue to work there. But it's about equity. Each kid gets what he or she needs, not dropping this child down. Right. And to ensure that that doesn't happen, our curriculum and instruction folks are working on building up our gifted and talented programs and other programs that might not necessarily be titled gifted and talented, but for more highly abled and just differentiating ex, you know, instruction and opportunities. And the other part of that is opening up access for students to have and take advantage of all of these programs. You'll see as we continue to uh, report to you that there are programs that are offered at one school that are not offered at another school. That's an access issue. It's also equity. So if it's great for this group of students at this school, why is it not offered and great for a group of students at another school? So that's equity as well. So it's a lot of learning that has to happen when we talk about equity. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm just going to say so many times equity is confused with equality. Yes. Yeah. And so when you have this, many people think you need this. That's equality. Mm -hmm. This right. is equity. Mm -hmm. And they're going to move up too. Mm -hmm. So they're right. never going to go here. They're all going to get what they're most capable right. of Point. earning. Excellent. Yes. That's excellent. Excellent. I've been going to my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it shows. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Just one last little thing. Um, are we then in turn going to rewrite the vision? and goals of the county that to really, because you've got this equity we woven through the whole thing, and I think we're lacking a little bit of that in our vision. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, my first year is largely, and I continue to do a lot of listening. I continue to do a lot of listening and observing and understanding. And I really am committed to doing that before I set myself and our leadership team up you know, to the public to say, okay, this is where we're going to go. We aren't the only ones involved. It has got to be buy-in. It's got to be something that we all agree is the right thing to do. And quite frequently, as educators and the community, we need to see it happen and that it is going to be successful before we buy into it. So we're slowly getting there. And when we feel like we've got the masses, then we'll start looking at how we need to change our branding because that will be the next thing. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. thank you for all your hard work. Can you pull on? Mm -hmm. I can drive. <coughs> Start. Start there. So, our, our next presentation, and I don't have my agenda right in front of me. Uh, is is Miss Pauls? Thank you very much. Am, am I saying that right, Mr. Teach? Yes, oh, principal teacher program. program. Teacher mentor program. Okay. Oh, yes, so. teacher principal mentoring. I've got Ms. a Paul. different good schedule. Hey, good evening again. Is that you more comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You moved so far. <laughs> 
Um, I, I'd like to, again, welcome um, Mrs. O'Connor to the team. It's great to have you here, and also to congratulate um, Ms. DiMaggio on being the president and Ms. George on being the vice president. Thank you. Thank you. So I have the honor of talking a little bit about the principal mentor program and the teacher mentor program, and I'm telling you, I think I have the best job in the system. So the purpose of the, both of the programs are to provide support to our novice teachers and principals. We serve as critical friends because we're not evaluative at all. <clears throat> and we really want to increase the success rate for our students, teachers, and principals through these programs. So our major objectives are to enhance their skills and knowledge, make sure that they feel comfortable and confident and are happy. So we want to increase their longevity here in Queen Anne's County. We don't <coughs> want to spend time training new folks and then lose them. And really, we're always looking at increasing student achievement, and that's by looking at different models of effective teaching and learning, really focusing on classroom management, communication with all stakeholders, especially our parents, really looking at our policies and procedures, and making sure that we're monitoring the success of the program. So we have, I have uh, 12 mentors that we meet monthly with. They work on a part-time basis. They're all retired teachers. Some uh, have been former principals. Mr. McNeil was here earlier and spoke to you. He's one of our mentors. They have to meet the state criteria, have a commitment to really work hard and be passionate about what they do, have a valid driver's license because many of them serve up to six teachers uh, at various schools. So they have to really be able to um, be mobile. So how do we get to where we decide what we do with the mentors is last year we gave some surveys and we do that at the end of each year. We give surveys to our mentees, to our mentors, and to administrators. And we had an over an 80, 90 percent uh, return rate with our mentors, but at least 80 percent with our administrators and our mentees. And we really combed through every bit of our survey data. And just, I just added a few questions to kind of give you an idea of some of the, of the questions that we posed. How often you meet, how helpful uh, you are, what are your areas of conversation, what are some of the benefits, and what effect has this program had on the following areas. And you can see that our survey data was extremely high. Uh, and it was very positive, and we use this data to drive the professional development for our, our mentor meetings. Um, so our goals, basically, again, to provide management tips, uh, and that was for the mentors. So after looking at all the survey data, we said, let's develop a goal, and that's something that hadn't been done in the past, but we wanted to have something that we worked from for each of our meetings. And then for the mentees, again, based on their feedback, will adhere to school-based tech integration guidelines and keep mentors informed of those guidelines because it varies by school. So we said each of the mentees is responsible for making sure the mentors know exactly what those guidelines are for their schools. And then for administrators, based on the feedback, it was to continue to maintain positive relationships with the mentors and the administration and provide effective coaching. And again, we stress that coaching piece because it is non-evaluative. Uh, some of the things that we've done regarding professional development is really looking at how our adult learners learn, and we really are spending a lot of time on coaching. What's it look like as a coaching model? Uh, focusing on the standards for instruction, uh, countywide professional development. The mentors actually attend the professional development sessions with the new teachers, so they have an idea of what they're actually learning, and they can help them with their planning of instruction. And then for the administrators, we're really looking at standards for administrators. Have 12 mentors countywide. Six of those mentors serve 18 elementary novice teachers. So you can see they have a full load. Four mentors serve 14 middle school novice teachers, and seven of them serve 16 high school novice teachers. So you can you very well may have a mentor who serves elementary, middle, and high school. We try to have them assigned to what their content area of focus is, such as Richard McNeil was strong with math. We try to have him to work with all of our math teachers. Uh, one mentor, which is me, serves four uh, novice principals and two second year principals. Uh, our mentor meter meetings are held monthly. We've had each of the supervisors to come in and talk about what their um, initiatives are for this school year. We also had each of the teacher specialists to come in and meet and talk about their school-based initiatives. We are also doing a book study, which was done last year with the teacher specialists and the administrators called Excellence Through Equity. So again, you see those common threads throughout everything that we're doing and with every group of our stakeholders. 
Uh, we really focus on system initiatives. They know all about the Innovation Center. They've had time to look at data from every school that they service, and we have monthly logs that they keep. And I read each and every one of those logs, and those logs are used to plan our <coughs> meetings and provide support for our mentors. Um, the budget really calls for three hours monthly meetings and then two-hour visits for our mentors. And we also provide money for substitutes so we can take our novice teachers to see some of our more experienced teachers and in specific areas where they may need just a little bit more support. And again, money for our book study. I asked for some feedback for each of our stakeholders as to what this program means to them. Uh, and you can certainly read those quotes but I think you will find that they're very positive, that the program has been very successful throughout the years and continues to be successful and supporting all of our different stakeholders. Everyone felt as though it was a very positive experience for them. And when uh, we met with our new teachers, they just had nothing but good things to say and again, continue to say as they meet with their mentors. So you can see it's mutual respect, it's trust, it's energy, it's a passion for what they do, and they're so appreciative of it. So um, we have a great time, and I think that the schools are really being supported. And as I'm out and about meeting with principals, I have the opportunity to see the mentors out and about meeting with new teachers. So it's a win-win for everyone. Questions? Thank you. Are they all uh, retired teachers? They are. They are. They are. And they're all from our system. From our system. Yeah. And we had a unique situation this year because we've had new counselors, which we haven't had many in the past. And so we're about to bring um, Wayne Larimore back to work with our high school counselors down at Ken Island High School. And we also have uh, two new counselors at the middle school. So we're working on providing support. But I also try to stop in and meet with them to see what their needs are and then collaborate with Mr. Um, Engel as well because they're having those monthly meetings. So we're really trying to make sure that everyone feels supported um, as we, we're out and about in schools. That's great. <clears throat> thank you, Janet. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pauls. Thank so you, Janet. Our next uh, presentation is going to involve a update from our Innovation Center teams. Good evening once again. For the record, my name is Greg Pluski, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, uh, and it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you an update this evening of our Curriculum Innovation Center progress. Uh, this evening is to do just that. Uh, by way of background, if you remember in July of 2016, uh, Dr. Thunberg from Curriculum Management Associates uh, updated the board and provided a presentation on an overview of the findings from our curriculum management audit that you can find. It's over 275 pages. It is very extensive, uh, but we believe that that has really set us with an area of focus moving forward. And also by way of background, the Innovation Center is really our response to the curriculum uh, management audit as a way to organize staff members uh, of our highest leadership from around our, our district into project management teams where they're able to take the deliverables and work on those deliverables and able to move those forward. And tonight you're going to see uh, just a little over one year how much progress that we've made thanks to the leaders that are sitting uh, behind me. Uh, wow, I'm really happy on this. <laughs> So also, just to frame this, that there are five Innovation Center teams. Each one of these themes is based on an organizational theme that had emerged uh, prior upon uh, my entry into the district uh, on these five key areas that we believe are key important areas for moving our system forward in organizational effectiveness, early learning and school readiness, curriculum instructional tools, leadership and professional development, monitoring uh, uh, performance, uh, uh, progress and performance. 
each one of the individuals that are you're getting ready to meet is a project and process manager. They are the senior leadership of each one of those teams. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to come. They're going to introduce themselves, and they're going to give you a very, very brief update on where they are as it relates to the deliverables and the curriculum management audit. It's my pleasure to introduce to you. Wow. Team one. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dan Harding, assistant principal at Kenown High School. Scotta Higdon uh, is with me. She's a teacher specialist at Mattapique Middle School, uh, and we are leading our organizational effectiveness team. So in the uh, spirit of being as brief as possible, we, um, our group shifted from uh, last year focusing mainly on the, the budget, which came, as Mr. Pluski said, out of the curriculum management audit. We took some suggestions and some, some needed areas there, but we've moved now on to strategic planning. Um, and so really our goal going forward for the majority of this year, uh, and perhaps even, even further if necessary, is to revise the district five-year strategic plan, focusing on really just a few key district initiatives. Um, so what we did, um, oops was we looked at two pieces. One, I, I believe, to be a pretty simplistic kind of first start that's necessary, but, but relatively simple. And then the second piece uh, is much more complicated. So the first is simply, we looked to see, and the curriculum management audit uh, led us in this direction. We did not have, and we still currently do not have, a policy regarding strategic planning. So our team has developed a draft policy that's still in, uh, I'd say, a rough draft form. So when, and in the near future, we have a meeting uh, next week but we're soon going to present to the executive team a draft that we're going to present uh, that will be read hopefully before the Board of Education and, and eventually adopted. That piece, like I said, is relatively simple. The, the second piece, though, is the five-year strategic plan. Uh, the five-year strategic plan, and Captain Kelly, you had, I think, started kind of going down this road, is something that, that really the organizational effectiveness team will devel develop looking at many different area school systems, I think we have a, a strong um, group within the state of Maryland, but we'll look outside of the state as well, and, and we'll put a strong framework together that will then put a, a recommendation to the executive team that we look to build a very effective um, and current five-year strategic plan that will include equity, uh, a focus on equity, it will include a focus on uh, data-driven decisions. Uh, ultimately pushing student learning uh, with a focus on 21st century uh, to be the best it can be here in Queen Anne's County. So that's a large undertaking. We'll begin that next week. Uh, and I expect that to take us the majority of the school year with uh, a significant input from the executive team. Yep. Are there any questions regarding our portion of the Innovation Center? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So good evening. Um, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, I did. Much better. So my name is Susan Walbert. I am the supervisor of early learning, Title I, Title III, and migrant education. Um, good evening. Here with me is Becky Tudman, who is the teacher specialist at Ken Island Elementary. Cannot thank her enough for um, what she does for our team, too, early learning. We all know that early learning is um, certainly the, the foundation, and we know how important to build a foundation for our students. So um, we take a lot of pride in our team. One of the things that um, we are doing as a team is is knowing how important it is for us to build partnerships with the community and the people who who are holding on to our students before we get them so we know that that's something that that we really need to focus on is building those those partnerships um, Becky I'll let you talk about those three bullets okay so our first deliverable is community partnerships. Helen Keller once said that alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. So our, uh, our deliverable of utmost importance is building those community partnerships. And as a team, we have come up with a wide variety of ways to do this. Last year, we <coughs> did complete a 
updated parent survey that can be used in pre-K and kindergarten to gather more specific information to help us with the placement of our students in pre-K and kindergarten classes. <coughs> we are looking to create um, a welcome brochure for various community agencies. We think that it would be a great idea if we could actually take this brochure and distribute it at doctor's offices. We could have it in grocery stores. There's lawyers' offices. There's so many places we could have it. Um, we know we've all been at meetings before where um, you have time to read or you show up to an appointment and you have some time to read as you wait. Why not reach out to the community, let them know what we're doing with early childhood and school read readiness and our plan for our future students. We also are looking to create a pre-K and kindergarten booklet for the parents' first school experience. It's scary not only for the children, but for the parents. And if we can create some stronger relationships with them to help them to know what to expect and how to prepare their child, we think that would be <coughs> extremely beneficial. And also a pre-K and kindergarten list of resources for families for the first school experience. So <laughs> that list of resources um, we think would be extremely beneficial. The uh, next section that you'll see is the uh, early childhood family support. We know how important mental health is for our, um, our early, as a piece of the early learning. We also know that there's very few resources out there for our families as far as mental health is concerned. The um, duty center, which partners with Southersville Elementary, just sponsored um, a uh, healthcare professional that spoke to almost 40 stakeholders about mental health. Um, we were very fortunate that uh, there were some school personnel there as well to, to start to learn about that. We want to be able to bring some of that information into the schools to, to support our families. We have a date set for a KRA information night. If those of you who are not sure about KRA, it's kindergarten readiness, <coughs> kindergarten readiness assessment which measures whether our students are ready for kindergarten and it, it begins, they, they take that at the beginning of, of their kindergarten year. We know that that information is, um, it's vital information that, that we need to backtrack and find out those students who, who are maybe are not demonstrating readiness, um, where were they prior to that and, and what information can we partner with those, those different stakeholders to, to let them know. So that night, um, February 22nd, we're going to bring in as many stakeholders as we can to try to give them information uh, about what it takes to be ready for kindergarten. The other things that we are looking at is, is uh, we have that KRA data and another measure for early learning is our second grade benchmarks, um, end of the year benchmark. And we, we, you know, we want to make sure that, that, the, um, that the KRA data is mirroring what's happening all along the way up until second grade. We want to make sure that that second grade data is going to match how those students perform on park when they're in third grade. So we're going to make sure that we're preparing them. We also want to make sure that we are getting all the information that the state the state is bringing down um, in this area. I, I know that Dr. Kelly spoke about um, early learning. It is out there and people are paying attention to it and we are very excited about that. So we want to make sure that the updates that, um, that come from the state get to the principals. We're going to look at pre-K registration. Um, we, we spoke a lot about this at our last innovation team meeting, making sure that we are consistent across the board with, with registering our fam families and um, making sure that if they're in Southersville or Ken Island Elementary, they're receiving the same, um, the same kind of welcome. We also are looking at creating and implementing an uh, early learning um, kind of walkthrough tool based on Nell Duke's essential practices to make sure that we're seeing those things in our early learning classrooms. Any questions? Good. All right. Team Thank three. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rob Watkins. I'm the supervisor of mathematics. Uh, I am the uh, the project manager for Team 3 uh, Curriculum, Instructional Tools, and Assessment. My process manager is uh, Mrs. Bridget Passon, who's the supervisor of English. Uh, she's not able to be with us tonight because uh, she's uh, doing some park work, work with park in Chicago this week. 
Um, we are, are really, uh, the, the curriculum audit um, may, uh, really requested us to put together a committee comprised of key district instructional leaders to develop and monitor instructional models. We are that team. Um, last spring, we delivered to you a comprehensive curriculum management policy that kind of uh, outlined the need and the procedures uh, and process by which we should use to kind of make sure that each course that we have in Queen Anne's County Public Schools uh, has a, a, a full comprehensive curriculum. Um, since then, we have developed a, a draft, a final draft, of a curriculum development guide, uh, purposes, practices, and procedures that outlines uh, the, 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 the templates, the processes, and the expectations for each uh, course curriculum that we use in our, in our district. Um, it, it took the work of our team uh, several months to come up with this, and we are very proud of this. I'm happy to say that several content supervisors used this tool to help guide the curriculum um, revisions over this past summer, and we're uh, continuing to look at how we um, create, uh, revise, and deliver uh, the curriculum to our schools. This year, uh, our primary focus has been on instructional models. We, we, went up, we went upon and looked at each school's instructional um, informal observation tools, the things they use when they go into classrooms, what are they looking for to ensure that the instructional models used are appropriate and best for our students to make sure that they're getting the most out of each day in class. We collected those and then we created on our, on, on our, on our, by our team an informal observation tool that's still in draft form and started to outline um, a, a really compilation of all the things we saw around our district and the best practices of instruction. Uh, this is a tool that can be used across all contents with a, a specific content piece added to, added to it to ensure that so in mathematics, on elementary mathematics versus a secondary English class, we're using the right strategies and we're highlighting the right strategies, but over the course of you know, each visit, we're looking for equitable practices, we're looking for correct pedagogical strategies, and we're looking for good feedback given to kids each day. Uh, additionally, we also want to formalize the kind of feedback we give the schools when content supervisors go into buildings to provide those walkthroughs. So there's a draft uh, overview that we are uh, piloting, currently piloting, to, 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 to give that information. Uh, two other things that we are working on th this year is we are currently just beginning uh, a needs assessment uh, looking at our uh, learning or instructional management system. So currently we use a variety of platforms to help support our curriculum. Curriculum Loft, Unify being our assessment platform. And we're looking just to make sure we're getting the most out of our, our money with the things that we spend and we're also making sure that those things are aligned to the instructional models that we are looking for. Uh, lastly, we are currently working with Comtech um, and examining when we buy uh, devices, when we buy technology, making sure it's in tight alignment with the instructional models that we're using in our district. We want to make sure when, when we purchase a new laptop, when we purchase a new instructional technology tool, that it's, it's, it's there and the, and the professional development is, is there to provide the support to the school so that we're in tight alignment with that. Is there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jackie Wilhelm. I'm the principal at Churchill Elementary School, and my process manager is Carrie Mitten from Sudlersville Middle School. We are principal. <laughs> We're happy to talk to you tonight about Team Four, which is the leadership and professional development team. One of the large deliverables that we are working on this school year is looking at our current teacher observation platform tools and process. Our current uh, program that we're using, Performance Matters, really uh, has been the same program we've used for several years. And during that time, the program itself has made many upgrades, although we've stayed with the basic model that we first adopted. There's the program itself, the platform, is much more user-friendly these days for principals, and it also has many features that allow it to connect with our data warehousing and generate reports that will help us determine what type of professional development needs we have to better service our teachers and everyone in the future. So we're really interested in sort of upgrading what we have and at the same time we've always worked very closely with our teachers association as we've done anything with our observation or evaluation tools. So we have reached out to our teachers association and we are going to be meeting with them at the end of this month to talk about what the new platform looks like, what impact it may have on them, and to get some feedback from them about maybe some changes that they might like to see. 
We're also working very closely with Team 3, who you just heard from, as they're looking at those informal documents. We think this platform may also be very beneficial as a mean for them to house that data as well. So we're really hoping to streamline what we have, put everything together in the same place, make it much more accessible and much more effective for our use. Another thing that we have on our plate is the District Comprehensive Professional Development Plan that will help to guide our professional development as we move further into the future. One smaller component on that that we are getting ready to work on, and I know that you're looking at the 1819 calendar this evening, and when some final decisions are made about that, we'll be able to create our professional development calendar for next year. And what that does is look at those professional development days and determines which ones will be district level days and which one will be school based days as far as providing professional development to our teachers. One final note on the observation platform, it's at no additional cost. That was a very good so point. I didn't that say. Was <laughs> yeah, that was really important. <laughs> probably didn't didn't want to leave that, that off. No, that is a great point. It's good news. <laughs> Any questions? Questions? That was probably a question. <laughs> well, I didn't want to ask, but um, yeah, that, that is really important. Yes. <laughs> really important. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Carol Camp, principal at Graysonville Elementary School. I am the project manager for Team 5, and with me I have Kevin Kintop, who is the program director of Anchor Points Academy, and he serves as our process manager. So our big job is to develop a district-wide K-12 assessment plan that really looks at whether or not the assessments that we are using are effective in making sure that our students are achieving what they need to achieve. Um, this year, our, our deliverables really have focused on the mandate, more learning, less testing act, which is the House Bill 461. And there are several mandates in there for counties. And so we are working on working on some of those mandates. The first mandate that we're working on is a rubric. Each county has been asked to develop a rubric to evaluate their local assessments. And this would be a tool for supervisors, teacher teams, or schools to use when they develop an assessment. And it's to determine and to make sure that the assessments that we are using are quality. So we have developed a, um, a draft for a rubric. We looked at rubrics from Anne Arundel County, uh, Howard County, St. Mary's, and Wicomico, as well as guidance from the State Department. And we developed a rubric. Um, our next step will then be to field test our rubric to make sure that what we want it to accomplish, it does. So we'll be trying the rubric out with several of our assessments to see how it works and if it gives us the information that we need. Um, Kevin, I'll let you take the next one. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we're doing is to meet the mandates is we have to have a county established committee. Um, an assessment committee and what we need to start with is to have a meeting with the teachers association and the local education um, uh, members, uh, the superintendent, assistant superintendent, um, Dave Brown from testing and accountability. We need to look at the current percentages of testing that we are doing in classroom, what meets those state guidelines. Um, they have given percentages that we need to meet at so we need to meet with the teachers association and come to an agreement as to what our numbers are and are they acceptable as a group. And then what we're going to do is take that information and we're going to develop a, a county level committee that's going to include parents, staff members, uh, administrators, and so forth that's going to meet on a regular basis. This is a committee that's going to be ongoing um, to talk about assessments um, and talk about what's going on as far as the amount of testing, the quality of the <coughs> testing, and is the testing um, helping us to move our educational process forward. So our future deliverable, which is also uh, from House Bill 461, is to design an evaluation tool 
to look at our reading and math and other interventions that we use with students who are lagging behind academically to make sure that we have the right interventions for our students and that the interventions are providing the results that we really want them to have. And we would look at not only evaluating what we have, but also evaluating what else is out there and what else might be good to bring to the county as far as uh, different interventions. Um, so we'll really be looking at student performance data, making sure the intervention is aligned to our curriculum standards, and we'll be using some sort of criteria to measure the effectiveness of these interventions. And we'll be doing a lot of, we're trying to figure out how to do data analysis with this. This is another big task that we're doing. And, and as you've heard through other presentations tonight, at every building there's different interventions that are going on. It's years and years of interventions that have been happening. So our job has been to collect everything that's going on so that we can really find out what is getting the most bang for the buck. Because interventions are one of the most costly pieces when dealing with academics. So you want to make sure you have a good tool to identify if it's going to be effective. And it's a good tool to identify if the things that we're already doing aren't effective and we don't want to put our money towards them. We want to put them to things that are going to make a difference for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so that concludes uh, our, our update. One of the things that, that I want to do very, very quickly is uh, recognize each one of these project and process managers for their leadership. Uh, they work constantly on this. They work on it once a month and their organization and I can't thank them enough for their leadership. I can't thank Ms. Paul's leadership enough uh, that helped last year to really get the Innovation Center off the ground and I think you can see in one short year that we've taken very seriously what the audit has said and we've moved it immediately into action. And with that, I'll, if there are any other overarching questions, I'll be happy to answer those. And again, I'd like to thank our project and process managers for their leadership. Just there, have one th uh, yes, Captain Kelly. Well, I just want to thank you all, too, because I know this is extra, because you all have other jobs, which is clear. And, and this is just awesome work. It is very heavy work, deep, heavy work. So <coughs> it, thank it, you. That, I know that's it, a lot of work. It, it, and there, there's so much enthusiasm from you all, which is They, really they do, cool. and we try to use existing structures like our ANS meeting we have once a month, and we build an innovation center time so they don't have to have another meeting. So we try to utilize that. And what you'll also notice is the structure in itself is a leadership development structure. So we're also trying to grow leaders as well um, as they move forward in their own journey. So thank you, Captain Kelly, for, for recognizing that and, and recognizing their work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so next we're going to um, hear from Mr. Engel, who's going to pre present uh, goal four from the strategic plan. Thank you. Okay. Her Good evening, esteemed board members, and congratulations to Ms. O'Connor. Thank you. For your... Uh, selection. I know having worked with you on the local management board for years, I know you're very dedicated to students. Um, I'm here to talk about goal four, which is uh, organizational effectiveness, communication, engagement, and partnership. And just to give an overview, I know in the last presentation uh, they talked about in, in the Innovation Center how they're going to update a lot of these goals and strategies. Um, and you'll see you'll see when you see these goals that, that there are probably some things that we could add to this um, indicator to make it a little bit more relevant um, but for the first goal or the first item is communication engagement and partnerships and talking about uh, parent conferences and how um, elementary students will have a parent participate in at least one academic conference during the during the school year um, and we have some data to show in the fall of 2016 that uh, there was a there was pretty good uh, representation among the parents at the elementary level, and you know fell short of the goal. 
and in the spring, you know, kind of the same thing. But as we all know, it, it seems like the elementary parents are more involved. Uh, they have one teacher, typically maybe two teachers, and uh, you know, they are involved in the conferences and they attend. Um, however, when we get to the middle school level, when we look at this, you know, this indicator, you know, we see that the objective is to have 50% of middle school students have a parent participate in at least one academic conference the baseline of 23 percent you can see we fall quite short of that uh, goal um, and it's the same in the spring and it's a, I guess it's a different dynamic in middle school there's there's a number of teachers and I miss Poliski and I had talked to uh, some of the middle school staff and principals and it's my understanding that they they meet as a team uh, with, um, with the middle school teachers and so therefore it's it's uh, it's not as easy to get get the conference together and I think the teachers will reach out to parents as well at the outset sure uh, uh, just a couple things because obviously when you look at that and you go you know wow based upon the number of students and then number of, of uh, represented one thing to, to consider is that uh, this indicator has been around for a long time. It has never been revised. And one of the things I'll connect with Team One, when they look at our goals, our system goals, we want to really look at this indicator in and of itself. The thing to keep in mind about middle school conferences is just by the sheer number uh, and the time that they have, the best that any teacher could do is really about 40%. At an elementary level, you have about 25 students per teacher. At middle school, you might have 140. So just by sheer time, it's, it's very difficult to get to all uh, of the students. Most of the schools do meet uh, in a collaborative session. So you might have five or six teachers on a team and students that they have the most concern about that they'll, they'll schedule first. Uh, but our schools are working very hard in middle school to meet the needs. If a parent wants to uh, have a parent conference, they'll do it after school, they'll do it on their planning time. So one of the things that might not be reflective in this data is the fact that uh, if it's a virtual conference, it's, if it's a phone conversation, if it's something that's happened online that might not be captured in this data as well. So I think those are things you just have to, to keep in mind as it relates to looking at specifically at middle school conferences. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in 2007, I, I don't know how this goal is, but it's, it's been around a long time. And in 2017, there are a lot of ways to communicate with parents. And we, and that's something, you know, you hear about teachers emailing parents in the you know late at night and you know so so that the communication is there the relationship is there we know it's there this doesn't really reflect it but it is this is the data that we have yes I, I was gonna I had that down to mention because one thing is when you're a parent especially of a sixth grader which I think Jen ran into that this if you if you come from a middle school I mean an elementary school where you had this conference all the time and it was you know very intense when I went to sixth grade Nobody called me, you know, and I called them and said, where's my conference, like what you said. And they're like, well, there's no problem. We won't have a conference. And I said, well, I kind of want a conference, you know, because I had issues I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. and, but, but they, and they totally accommodated that. Mm -hmm. and, but then I started thinking with all those seven teachers or whatever, the, every one of them was there for my conference. I can't even imagine the scheduling nightmare that might sure. be. Sure. And and then the subs while you're in conference with them. So it was huge. They accommodated it. So I think, like you said, this doesn't mean anything. So I, when I was looking at this 50%, I, there's no way they can do that. But I don't know. My other question for you is how, how do you, what is the right percent? Not just on this, but on your whole presentation. This was a goal you said was set in 2007 on most of these goals. At um, least, at least. Okay, yeah. so we're going to look at what we, the numbers we, we should are. be. And, yeah. and, we got to make a higher. <laughs> and I think it's one of the uh, as we've as Dr. Kane has has entered the system. It's one of the questions she has asked about. Well, what is this goal? What is it actually measuring? So one of the things I think that we want to look at is actually possibly changing it to engagement. So whether that's parent engagement, community engagement, business community engagement. So it it opens up because it's. <coughs> Engagement is, is much bigger than, than just parents. So that's something that really Team One is going to be looking at in, in the revision of the goals that they'll make a recommendation. I mean, business partnerships, community partnerships, all, you know, we're talking about partnerships with the entire community. We know, you know, having been here a long time, and we all know 
that we do have great partners. And so it's not, it is the family that's the most important, but having these other partners as well. I agree, especially when they start getting older, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you hit the high school. I mean, I didn't know you even had a statistic on high schools, so that's good, good ideas. Okay. So let's talk about attendance. 100% of elementary schools will maintain a 95% uh, percent or higher attendance rate. And these are the attendance rates by uh, school for 2015 through 2017. And you can see, um, if we look at the 95% mark, you can see we're a little, we have been a little short. It's pretty clear. Um, and if you look at the secondary schools, and their uh, goal is to get 94%. And you can see sometimes they reach that goal and sometimes they do not. And at the high school, you can see it's sort of a, the last three years, certainly we have had a drop off on attendance. And, you, and I can connect it to a slide that's coming up um, because someone would ask, well, what do you do to address the attendance problem? And my answer is that um, I think the first thing you have to do, you have to look at those students that are chronically absent. And chronically absent means that you have missed 20 or more days in a school year. And that's, you know, that sounds like a lot. And then when you look at it, it's one day every two weeks. And that's, that's a lot of school. You're missing one day. And if you're in high school and you're on, you're on a semester, that's really like two days. You're missing a, a two 90-minute courses a month. And that's a lot of time out. And so if we look at, you know, some of the, um, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm sorry, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. sorry. No, I'm amazed by these numbers. Oh, okay. Saddened, too, in a way, yeah. how they've gone down. Yeah. So the, the, uh, you look at the attendance data by subgroup, and again, you can see we, we, we definitely you know, fall short in a lot of areas. Um, in the middle school, um, same thing. I mean, there they're seems to be consistent across the subgroups, a little bit of a variation. And then the high school, uh, and you can see also uh, there, there are some subgroups. looks like, you know, farms um, is definitely lower. You know, some of those subgroups, if you look at it, I was, I was trying to look at the year there yeah. in like 2016. You know, we have uh, had a, some immigration issues where I think some of these parents may not want to have sent their, been sending some of their schools to up, and, up county with the migrants because of the threats. You talked about that once. Where oh, that was just this year. Last, that was 2016 and up just, to no, well, that yeah, was just last year. school year. Yeah. It was when Donald yeah. Trump was elected. Right. It's so the there year. may have Sorry. been like there may have been <laughs> issues why their their attendance dropped off. You know by yeah, a, a situation point, yeah. in the well, I don't, country. I, I kind of disagree with that. That wasn't really a long period of time in North County that that yeah really I mean because those numbers dropped significantly. Yeah, I mean. That was only a matter of maybe a week or so. We went from 94% down to 85%. Right. That's huge. Yeah, I was trying to figure out why. And it Some of the previous slides did the same thing in different mm -hmm. categories based on school, the school, the year. It's did you ever coordinate the guess. amount of absences with the number of half days we have? Yeah. It's, it's what, what is like, that, that? I would like to look at like, Half day, mm -hmm. half day, how many students are absent on a half day? Yeah. And yeah, see that's, how that of court, that, mm, that's, a, that's a pretty good I have good not. Question. No, to be honest, I have not. But that is a really good point. And, and also days before holidays. Holidays. Also. Yes. Um, but I'll, I'll look at that. I want to pull that up. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. They get counted a whole absent day, but they really only had to come a half a day. But mom and dad might say. Child hey, care. Or, uh, child it's care. child care. Yeah. We're going to go sure. out so and a, do yep. an educational activity as a family it's for the day. It's child care. They're only going to miss half a day. This is more important. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. that would be a great statistic. Great. Jen? I will yeah. get that. Go. <laughs> so you saw the in a couple of previous slides sort of the down and this is uh, the percentage of students absent more than 20 days. You see it go up. So there's a correlation, an absolute correlation um, with students that are missing more than 20 days, that number's increasing. And I think that's where the impact is. And so that's sort of the direction of the focus for our student attendance, looking at those students that have missed 20 or more days. And so like I said, chronically, a chronically, truant, a chronically absent students misses 20 days a year. 
habitual truant is unexcused absences of, of 18% per year. So these students that are missing 20 days, they could be excused <clears throat> or not excused. They're just not in school. So, um, you know, taking a look at that and... Well, that's kind of scary with that high school rate. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it, is that broken down by grade wise? Do you have that broken down? I can. I did not 20, do it here, but I'll be happy. With 20 days? Yeah, ninth, I did, ninth graders in, compared to seniors. Right, I would be interested in seeing how, how that's broke down if from they drive, ninth through they 12th don't. grade, each mm -hmm. grade. Yes. Um, to see where, where we have, because that's kind of really um yeah you know i should have done that but I, that. yeah I, I i can do that very easily and get that all this okay. comes from the mail and report cards right, do we all. see any improvement if and when we do have to send home you know the truancy letter that you've missed so many days that you were on the verge or you have entered into the truant system um do we see an improvement in those students getting well, back to school yeah when we do that that's primarily at the elementary level where we have those issues with with the younger kids we do you know, and we don't like to go there. We don't like right, to threaten, right. you know, legal action and take I'm going to be perfectly court, but honest. I got one one year, and I was shocked. I was like, why in the world would we get this? Was it this was just for daughter. missing? Yeah, for the... And, like, yeah. second or third grade. And then when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, yeah, she does seem to have a stomachache every Monday or every Friday. And I guess I am keeping her home when she doesn't feel good. So, of course, I made her go to the doctor, and he said she's fine, and off to school she went, and it didn't happen again. It was just one semester. Mm -hmm. But it did get my attention. Well, we do do that, yeah. and they in the schools do that. And that's what I'm so asking. Do you see an improvement in those <coughs> students missing 20 days or more next semester may be improving because they've been called on it? Well, that's the goal, and I will say sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes, yes. So, and so there's some situations that, that it requires a little a more than that. In certain yeah. instances. Yeah, we have two PPWs that work very hard. They visit homes and they make home visits when yeah. needed. And there's, there's a, yeah. we have a lot of in interventions in place. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, so, so. Gotcha. That's probably the high school there. Great. All right, so uh, at the elementary students absent more than 20 days. And, and again, that number is increasing. Too. So, yeah. And these are not, or are they, medical absences as well as injuries, anything, as anything. well as family dynamics. Any yeah. And remember, we do have students that we do have home hospital. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I will tell you, you know, the, and I've talked to Dr. Kane and Mr. Paluski about this quite a bit. We have a lot of students that um, go out on home hospital for, yep. you know, anxiety yep. and depression. And yep. I know there's a lot of students at all levels that are, still not comfortable coming to school for one reason or another. And that's so, peaked yeah. recently. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. So the middle school, same thing um, by subgroup. So there's a lot of data here that I put together, but, it's, but I think it's very relevant um, in the high school students by subgroup. You see in, in a lot of cases it's kind of climbing up, so. Do you find out ever have a data collection as to what they may tell you as to why they missed? There's a lot of reasons, you know, and we do, we have a lot of individual interviews with students and especially at the high school students. <laughs> right. One of our interventions is a, a lot of times students are coming to school because they like a smaller setting. So we have a number of students at anchor points that, um, you know, fit into that category. And so we're looking at a lot of things, you know, first of all, we're looking at our attendance policy and we're, we, revising that to take a look at what works best and we're looking at some of the best practices from around the state and the country to look at to look at our attendance policy and also we have to look at how we serve kids you know we've been kind of doing things the same way for a long time and i've been here since 1989 and things haven't changed a lot except in the last you know couple of years so we have to i think we have to look at how i feel now we are at a place where we can really start looking at how we can help kids, especially high school kids. And I've had some wonderful conversations with Dr. Kane and Mr. Paluski about, you know, their philosophy is let's help kids. Let's find a way to help children. And so when we look at our attendance issues, it's more than just numbers. It's more than just I'm going to keep my kid home today. There's a, it's a lot deeper than that. And so we have to look at these issues. We've got to look at every individual student. And we got to find solutions that's right for that student. It may not be the same. You know, we talked about equity. One solution 
might not be the same for this student <coughs> as it is for this student, but if it works for that student, let's go. Let's do it. So, um, you know, so I'm very optimistic that we're going to turn that on the upswing. I think our attendance rates are going to go up, I'm confident. So, it's and nice those are hear. some of our interventions. Um, you know, obviously, I, I know I've, I've gone on longer than I intended to, but, you know, some of these um, interventions are very important. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw that, one. Dr. King. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm kidding with you. Go ahead. But anyway, having a positive school climate is the most important thing that you can do for students, you know, welcoming environment. So that's all. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Thank Engel. you, Mr. Engel. I guess there's no, I guess there's no <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We really do have a dedicated team that uh, mm -hmm. work with our students and, and visit homes and go pick children up and, and all manner of things. So uh, we, we are, we've got work to do, but we have some dedicated folks that are ready <laughs> to do that work. So our next presentation is going to be quick, and that is Ms. Landgraf. She's going to share with us the monthly expenditure report. Okay. It's always quick. <clears throat> um, basically, you have two reports in front of you. Um, one of them is the 30,000 foot view, which gives you each of the categories in the budget and how much has been spent there. And then the second one gives you a 10,000 foot view, with, which breaks it down a little bit farther. Um, at this point in time, there's only one area of the budget that I'm really concerned about, and that is transportation. And we've had to hire some additional uh, drivers this year in order to transport some of our special needs students and we're keeping a very close eye on that at this point in time but i do anticipate before the end of the year we will need to transfer money into that category to cover those expenditures and is, is that mainly why because of our group of students that we need to transport outside of the county for yes, education we have quite a few students that we're transporting to over in the Baltimore area every day and because of the timing of when schools start mm -hmm. we're not able to um, have several of those students right. ride on the same right. bus they're each on individual but buses that's, that's the main place we've seen our increase yes so, and that's something we can never ever gauge right we have to do the best we can in our guesstimate put it in our budget and we don't know until we know thank you Any questions? Okay, okay, thank you. And moving on to our uh, presentation on the 2018-19 calendar, Ms. Uh, Mr. Brown and Dr. Pearson, please. Good evening, for the record, uh, I'm David Brown, Supervisor of Accountability, and I have Dr. Pearson here with me tonight, who is our Interim Communications Specialist. And we have had the pleasure of working with our calendar committee to relook at the 2018-19 school year calendar. Uh, just a brief history as to where we've been with this. Last fall, we brought two calendars before the Board of Education, uh, one for this current school year and one for the 2018-19 school year. Both were approved, so the 2018-19 calendar does stand as approved right now. Uh, however, later on in the school year, several teachers approached us and asked us to relook at the 17-18 calendar, and they made some very good suggestions to change it and make it more efficient. So we acted on that last year and we updated the 2017-18 calendar to what it is now. However, we never went back and re-looked at those same changes in the 18-19 calendar. So what we have done now is we've gone back and looked at that calendar and we have cleaned it up a lot. Uh, there were several problems with the existing calendar. Uh, we had an incorrect PSAT day. Uh, College Boards has, has moved the test up a week. Uh, we actually had the incorrect date for Martin Luther King Day. And we have corrected that. One of the problems with the 1819 calendar in its original format 
was we thought we were being very creative and we <coughs> had separate PD days for the elementary schools from the, middle, uh, from the high schools. Uh, it was very creative. We had never done that before in the county. It, it looked good on paper. But then we started hearing from parents that it becomes a child care issue because they can't depend on the high school students to watch their elementary and middle school students if the schools are open different days. And it also became a transportation issue because we were now transporting students 182 days instead of the 180 days. So again, we needed to clean that up in this re-look at the calendar. We also had new COMAR regulations that came out. When we developed this calendar, we were looking at five school days that had to be built into the school calendar. Since then, uh, Maryland has changed the regulations. We now only need to include three snow days uh, or inclement weather days in the calendar. <laughs> the original calendar, November, was a mess. Uh, because of where Election Day fell, where Thanksgiving fell, uh, conferences, we went the entire month of November without a full week of school. So we opted to, to look at that and see if we could clean that up as well. And we also wanted to address those concerns of the educators that helped us so much with this current year's calendar and bring those suggestions into the 1819 calendar. So what you have before you is the draft that the calendar committee came up with. Uh, it is very similar to this current year calendar. Uh, we did clean up November a little bit so that we at least have two full weeks of school in November. It does meet the governor's guidelines of starting after Labor Day and ending school by June 15th. Similar to what we're doing this school year, we will end the year with half days so that teachers have time to shut down their programs and close out their classrooms. The last day for teachers will be the last day of school for students. It will be a half day. Can you explain to me one? <clears throat> I don't understand the um, June 13th where it's green, red, and a half day. <laughs> we just like, like to add colors on these to make it a little more confusing. I mean, is that a mistake? Or is no, that that's a, actually correct. What, what is um, it? The red day with a slash through it is a half day for high schools. Right. A green day is a half day for all schools. Just to make it clear, on the 13th, it is a half day for everybody. But since it's final exams, we use the red color for final exams for the high school. If you believe that's confusing, we can clean that up and just use a I green. I find it confusing. I, maybe it's just uh, Are we going to send that out to <laughs> parents looking like that? Uh, yeah, that was the plan, <laughs> yes, because the red shows really? it's a final exam day. No. I mean, it's just confusing. Yeah, me. that is. And it's um, confusing, and again, that's why we need to have more people look at it because, you know, the calendar committee has been looking at it. And it, actually, I believe it's the same way in this current year's calendar. It is. That's correct. Um, the same way. But if it is confusing and, and you would rather it go out as an all green, which would be an all schools half day without really specifying that's for final I exams, think that that's much yeah. we, can, we can clean it up that way very easily. Can I ask a question? What are the circles on September 4th, 5th, and 6th? That is the start of school. Just like we did this year, it will be a staggered start oh, of school. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. You don't have the, um... No, I, I'm just looking at it up, up yeah, top. The circle indicates that that is the first or the last day of school for a group of students. Oh, okay. So, so the 4th, 5th, and 6th, uh, you can see that the 4th is the, the first day of school for grades one through six, okay. nine and five at Sutlersville Middle. Okay, thank and then you. And that staggers in for the other schools. And the last day of school is also a circle for his last day of school for everybody. <clears throat> Wait a minute. What the calendar committee is suggesting is that we put this out for public comment. Yes. And hopefully we could Act upon it in January. You want to fix first of that? <laughs> uh, Mr. Brown, okay, yes, now I've just realized that we have a half of a day and a circle all on the 14th. The last day of school, yes. Yeah, that's the last day. The half day of school. It's only half a day. It's the last day of school. Circle, last day, oh half day, gosh, slash. That is confusing. <laughs> that is. Yeah. You got to read your key. Well, I am. I mean, sometimes I am. there's five parts to it. I'm like reading it here, but I'm thinking that this is going to be awfully confusing those last three days. We have to change something while these people say we never. Yeah, heard we are open for days. suggestions on, on the symbolism. I would take the circle out and just put a half a day. 
That's or maybe make it a different color. Well, it says, it school. says, yeah. it says <laughs> school <laughs> is, you know, everybody's going to know the school's out on the 14th. This is the same thing. That that's the last day of school, you years. know. And it, if you just put the half a slash to it, it means it's a half a day. We can, we can do that and just do away with the circle symbol yeah, that's, that's would be to the right opinion. there in the calendar key that says first or last day of school. Woo. We that Although we have to bring, it is, so, we, we have been using that, that for about the last say, four or five years. You still have to bring some kind of attention to this first three days because that is staggered for basic right. grades or school, schools. So, so you, you just still have last to be able to say, hey, this is there. different. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? I'm just joking. <laughs> what did you say? More colors. <laughs> I said maybe make that last one a different color. <laughs> wow. Mm. Take the circle out and make Star. it a different color. Yeah, put yeah, a, a new big old sheet. yellow star, a new sheet. red star. What? Yeah, that's um, make that's the first day of school in black. Oh, we're back off. Can I compliment you because I know the government rearranging everything and you having to do a whole new format for your calendar? I think you did a pretty good job with that. <laughs> I mean, I just want to compliment because I know it's probably <laughs> very tough. Hard job. So. Very tough. <laughs> Thank you. What? Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, the governor will ask soon about these last days on Saturday. So okay. we have three snow days. So if we <laughs> remove the circle for the last day of school <laughs> and make the 13th just all green with a slash through it and neither were you <laughs> with those changes we would like to put it out for public comment then and with the hopefully being able to get it approved in the January meeting and if we are lucky enough we may have a uh, 1920 calendar for you to look at first draft at that meeting as well but that's kind of our, the goal of the calendar committee mm -hmm. okay any other questions? No. no. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Her condense her goals to like two. Let's see. So this <clears throat> won't take long, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> see where I Are am. you tired of talking tonight? <laughs> A little bit, yeah. <laughs> tired of making that trip down those steps? <laughs> <laughs> It's been busy. Am I loaded up here, Miss uh, Wright? Mm. To know PDF. <laughs> PDF. PDF. Thank you. Okay, let's. So, good evening once again. I'm going to talk with you about uh, about my goals. New clicker must work really good. Okay, and so the purpose of this is just to share with you and the public what my goals are, uh, and I call them proposed until we agree that we're gonna we're gonna use these goals that I'm presenting today, and to solicit your feedback. Of course, I want to remind everybody of our theory of action. I remind our ANS team about this each month when we have our meetings. If we commit to work together to build shared knowledge, cultivate a collaborative culture take the actions necessary to ensure that every student learns at high levels and use evidence of student learning to inform and improve our collective practice, then all of our students will have the opportunity to meet their full potential for learning and perform at high levels. So I have a number of goals and they are as follows. So our, my professional goals include, um, of course, I'm going to continue to build my professional capacity and I'll do that by participating in several professional learning opportunities, some of which I have already engaged. Of course, I attended the MABE conference in October, the Maryland Negotiators conference in November. I'll be attending the School Superintendents Association conference in February of 18. And of course, we have professional development met it at our monthly uh, <coughs> superintendents meetings, not only for the state one, but for the uh, Eastern Shore superintendents as well. So I will continue to do those things. We have a student learning goal. And I would like to say, first of all, my goals are reflective of actions that need to be taken um, from the curriculum management audit. And my goals funnel down to our leadership team's goals, which are also inclusive of activities and goals set out in our schools. So we are all aligned. We're all work our arrows are pointing in the same direction. Um, and basically, that's about improving teaching and learning. Far as our student learning goal, uh, what I'm committing to doing is ensuring that we continue with our school monitoring visits at every school and determining that instructional leadership team's progress on their instructional goals. And you've heard this language today to uh, 
really confirm that they're all aligned. So of course you know that we've done our fall monitoring visits. They were completed by November and of course you know that phase two, our next round of monitoring visits will occur sometime between January and March. The next student learning goal is involving a uh, climate survey. So our leadership team is tasked with ensuring that we have a climate survey to measure the culture at schools across the district. Uh, based on, of course, that analysis of multiple districts across the country, we know that increases in a positive culture are associated with increases in student achievement. Now, this aligns with a requirement that we have from um, Every Student Succeeds Act, and that is that every district administer a climate survey. So Mr. Brown and, and a team of folks are working on um, ensuring that that work happens. If we, we do not have a, a survey that was um, given to us by the state at this point, not sure if we're going to get one, so we're working on a plan B so that we have our own survey um, and not that we will create it. We will probably purchase an, a research-based climate survey from a reputable uh, vendor. The next student learning goal is involving the work of the curriculum management audit. So as you can see, each of the teams are represented here, and my goal is to ensure that we are aligning our work and that to the extent that we're able to provide resources to get that work done, each area is going to have a plan, which they already do, to measure the implementation of those goals and, and the outcomes associated with them. So you heard a lot of talk tonight from the process and project managers about measuring the effectiveness of interventions and measuring the effectiveness of our work. That is going to uh, align with my goal here for each one of those areas. District improvement goal, of course, I'm going to continue to align the educational programs, plans, and resources with our vision and goals. I am also going to work with my leadership team and school-based leaders to sh ensure that we are embracing that philosophy, which we mentioned before, uh, and that leadership practices be guided through the lens of equity with that deep belief that all of our students can and must achieve at high levels. And that directly aligns with our philosophy with regard to equity. Without reading that to you, I'm ensuring that not only are we going to be held responsible for and account for our work in schools, we are also accounting for our work in the central office. So each department, whether we're talking about master facilities planning, communications, enrollment and assignment, hiring and recruitment, transportation, student services, discipline, or professional development, we're talking at looking at our work and ensuring that we have employed a lens of equity as we go about the processes of our daily activities. And of course, by June 30, 2018, I'm going to ensure that we have effective central office structures. Some of those I've spoken with you about, um, and not a secret with regard to the fact that we are uh, restructuring our uh, public information office. Um, there are some other areas that we're working with. Team one for the uh, innovation center teams, they are also looking at effective um, um, organizational practices. And so we'll be looking at ways that we can align our work and ensure that we are not only working um, uh, harder, but working smarter. Of course, I wanted to be sure Mr. P would not let me leave here without reminding you which day I am on in my uh, appointment here. So we're in about a day 108. And of course, we have continued through our listening and learning um, phases. We've been building our plans, as you well know, and engaging our stakeholders. Uh, you know that I have um, begun a, um, a series of um, groups where I'm asking for a advisory committees or advisory council. So I'm formulating a student advisory council, staff advisory, parent advisory, and then later in the spring we'll continue our work with our business advisory. And these are groups that are going to um, give some input in decision making. So we'll be able to present information to them, gather their input, and then use that input to direct this, the work of our district. And then we'll go ahead and, and we'll continue to plan and replan as we continue throughout the school year. Questions? I don't have a question. Mm -hmm. I just would like to make a statement. Yes, ma'am. What a fantastic job you have done. I shoot. In 108 days. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, thank you. Not, that's great. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm, I agree. I didn't realize, you know, you, you put months in your head, but sitting here and looking at day 108, thinking what you have accomplished, Such a we short made time. the perfect choice when we chose you. And I am so grateful that you did and so grateful for the team that you have surrounded yes. me with. Yes. We have a team, not only central office team, but we have a team in our schools that really do work hard to embrace our philosophy. We got work to do. We have a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of structural of work right. to do. Right. But that structural work is so critical because it's going to make the jobs that we do a little bit more easy, right. but it's most importantly going to make them more efficient. That's right. So exactly. our work is going to be um, pointed. And with that in mind, I just want to give a little plug. So uh, last time we met, we talked about a survey that we wanted to implement to gain the public's comments for uh, with regard to the budget because the last several years we've done this um, uh, town hall T sort of meeting and, and parents just are not making it to those meetings. As of this afternoon, we had 193 complete, 193. We used to have town hall meetings with one or three people. Right, We've got right. 193 completed surveys and for some reason we have 387 incomplete surveys. That means that people started but they didn't finish. So maybe it was too long. So we're going to continue to put plugs out to go back in and just finish up so that we can count those. Uh, but our next round of surveys it will likely be the climate survey. And that will be done by an agency that I've mentioned to you before. Don't know which vendor. But we'll be able to get reports tabulated. So right now because we don't have a vendor that really does these surveys we've got pages and pages and pages pages of comments. So now the work that we have to do is to start to categorize those comments and that is time consuming. So when we move forward we're going to use a vendor that does this work for us. We can just click buttons and get the reports and share that with you quickly. So we're moving in the right direction because people are interested and people are sharing their feedback. And it has not been on the website that long. It's been on there a couple of weeks. I was going to say, yeah, two weeks and we're going to keep it open. We're going to keep it open. And I would guess a lot of the ones that weren't completed, people went in to see what it was all about, and for whatever reason, didn't complete. Mm -hmm. They might not have had any intention of completing it anyway. They might have just thought, hey, this is new. What's this? Mm -hmm. And then thought, oh, that doesn't pertain to me and gotten out. So I think we have to give that some mm -hmm. kind of a. Uh, a number you know, of reasons, yeah. A number yeah. of things that we yeah. can just expect are going to be like that, and that's not really considered a negative. Your positive is you have 200 people that have answered this. Absolutely. Already. Sarah, In I'd like for a you very to share short period of time. what you had asked me earlier about the students. Um, I had a teacher present his concerns to me because a teacher and students, like we were just talking about in class, sort of, um, one of the concerns was that it was not being advertised to the student body enough because the students, of course, I know the parents got the robocall and their, um, it was presented on the website. I just know that they did not, um, they felt that they, um, it, unless their parents had notified them, you know, and I'm, I'm sure their opinions on the budget really isn't that important to you guys because who we we don't know students', students. opinions. Yes. Well, it's not it's not important to us. Uh, that that wouldn't be the case. This one was designed for parents and yes. community members. Employees can fill this out and, and that kind of thing. But we will be soliciting student feedback for that climate survey. Mm -hmm. That's for certain. And they were also um, they were worried about skewed data, but I told them that that really isn't a problem because they were concerned that Aunt Sally, who doesn't have anything to do with the school system, was going to take the survey and I told them that's not. And really and Aunt Sally, if Aunt Sally lives in Queen Anne's County and she wanted to take the <laughs> survey, she could because we do right. ask the question, do you have, have you ever right. had children? That's so that I gives explained. us that's some understanding of right. so who that was, is responding. That was my only concern and then I wondered yeah. how long is it open to the public? Like when are you? We're, we're probably not going to close it until about January. Right. So Awesome. Mm -hmm. okay. You're welcome. Um, should we start? or continue or did we ever send out reminders or is it just sitting there and they fall across it or are they done? Yeah, we so, so and we are continuing to send out reminders. Met with uh, Dr. Pearson and she's going to put a big push out and we're going to hit principles and, and remind them again at the ANS and we'll do a, um, Announce a big at PTA mm, meetings even maybe. everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Everywhere. It. Covers everything. Yes, ma'am. Great. Did you have a question, Ms. George? No, no uh, Ms. Annette just asked me if I um, had received it, and I said yes, I had. Okay. <clears throat> well, once again, thank you. No, thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate so it. What are we doing next? We're going to talk with you and.
closed session about this? Is that um, you certainly may. Now we have had um, one closed session conversation, and we certainly can add this to our next um, closed session agenda to um, uh, offer your you can offer your feedback, or or we can approve it and keep moving. We're talking about the goals or the survey? The goals. That's You're talking about the goals, okay. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we're moving. Let's see. This is their break. I'm not sure which one is. Anybody? Anyone? Thank you. Um, we are now at air break. Would anyone like to take a break or would we like to just continue on? Take a break. I'd like to take a break. Yeah, and there's a okay. We're up here with water, so we're in break. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the second half of the board meeting. Uh, we will now move on to the HR report. <coughs> May I have a motion to approve the HR report as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Transportation report. Yes, good evening, board members. We have um, one bus replacement, uh, Mr. Lawrence Chenaud, bus 3507, that it will be at the end of its 12th year. As you know, they can replace them at between 12 and 15 years. This bus is a bus that's used in the northern part of the county that has more miles on it than something that would be used down on around Kent Island. So he's asking for uh, approval to purchase that um, next year. I make a motion that we approve the purchase um, in 2018. Of, That's correct, yes, ma'am. Um, to replace bus 3507 for Lawrence Chenault. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. We, we'll move on to the field trips. Uh, Ken Island High School Wrestling to Stephen Decatur High School, January 12th to the 13th through uh, 2018. Stevensville Middle School, 6th grade to North Bay, May 21st to May 25th, 2018. Ken Island High School, bands to the University of Maryland, April 26th through April 27th, 2018. May I have a motion to approve the three field trips? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. I think I just read that, didn't I? But yeah, I got it twice. Yeah, it's something. No, it's something. No, it's you the same thing. Twelve and thirteen. Okay. Can I have high school? So we move on to uh, eleven point oh one policy use of. No, there's a couple north. There's a couple more field trips. Oh, oh, they're just no, we, we combine them. Twice. I have them twice too. Okay, they're all twice. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. That's, that's why I was confused. Yep. You're, you're okay. moving on then. Um, I see. Sorry. Now, no, how naloxone, you, naloxone, or other overdose reversing medications for the second read. Is there any been comment? Any comments been posted, Mr. Farley, on that? Well, we do have uh, one slight change uh, add to the policy. Dr. Kane informed us on November 7th that at the PAZAM meeting, we were to add to the uh, draft policy <coughs> that Narcan is to be implemented and used uh, at any of our school-sponsored events. And so you'll see in the policy, not only has it been reformatted into the new format, it's the regulation has been separated and changed to the regulation format. And in red, in the second paragraph, I believe it is, bear with me one second, in paragraph <coughs> B, you'll see that that change has been left in red. So you can discern that that was not in the original policy statement. So on behalf of Mr. Engel, I would ask you to let this move forward to the third and final read. But no comments? No, none. Okay, just changes. Yes. Just a change, that's all. May I have a motion to approve the policy use of? No, now we're putting it out for the third. And oh, final uh, oh, okay, okay. To the stakeholders for the third and final read. May mm -hmm. I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We'll move on to 11.02 policy, uh, grading policy. Um, I'll start with that because that was my, um, I had asked for this to be on the agenda, mostly for the middle school grading policy. Um, <clears throat> I had found, and mainly because I'm a parent of middle schoolers, 
that um, <coughs> I would like to bring to the attention of the, the public that the grading policy as, as read is 50% is are progressives, 50% um, count for masteries. Where I found it seems to be, I don't know if I would call it a flaw or something that needs to be examined, would be more for the unified arts in middle school policies. And for one example, I would, I would say um, the gym and health. Gym and health is one semester, but the state separates them on grading. Um, I believe that each section, gym being one and, and health the other, only requires one mastery test for each of those because I think it's unified arts have to have two, where I believe all the rest have to have more masteries. Um, so when you're looking at that, a health grade could, a student could potentially have all 100% on progressives, and being that they only need one mastery, a teacher could give a mastery, and a kid's having an off day, who knows what's going on. And if he scored the lowest grade, which would be a 40%, if that's worth 50% of his grade, he now is reduced to a 70%. And I don't believe that that's a true representation of the student. And I feel like in unified arts, maybe the masteries um, and progressives, we need to look at how much they are um, impacting the grade on both sides. Um, I don't believe it's fair for all students to have one test determine 50% of their grade. Um, I'm going to ask um, a question because I'm novice in the district and with this policy, we got a lot of work to do on, on policies, as you know. Um, is that a school building, Mr. P, um, procedure or is that a district policy? Because it, it our is policy actually, as it uh, reads. It, it, it's actually in the, the district procedures for courses that follow AB Day schedule. Okay. Um, at the interim report would have one mastery and then two progressives. Uh, so one of the things that, and, and I appreciate Ms. George that you bringing it up and, and since then I've started to dig into this a little bit more, uh, deeply. Mr. Watkins, uh, had actually co-chaired the original middle school, um, grading, um, committee, if you will. Last year under Ms. Paul's leadership, she had worked with the middle school principals and they were in the process of making some revisions to this policy. Uh, but I think at the time they want to just hold off until the there was a change in leadership So I know that among the principals and the supervisors There's been a, a variety of conversation around this policy One of the things that has also come to our attention that we want to do and this is a, is a good segue to what the superintendent talks about alignment We really need to have one grading policy that really within that one grading policy has how we grade for elementary with the trimesters and how we grade for middle school and how we grade for high school. So that's one of the things that's kind of come up as a result of this. So uh, we're looking at it. It's actually uh, what we're planning on is bringing a revised policy back by the spring. Uh, we're thinking somewhere along the lines of uh, April, uh, if we can get that work done in time or by May, mm -hmm. uh, so we can share with you some of the revisions. Uh, we're gonna be doing some spot checks uh, especially around the unified arts areas and look at a couple, uh, you know, students' grades and be able to look at that and see if, if there's, you know, it, it, is it a fair and, and equitable process. Anytime you go to implement any policy, it's, it's not really till you implement it till you start to see, you know, right. maybe we could have, you know, uh, look at things a little bit differently. So uh, we've already started that process. We're going to be happy that we're going to bring you back some suggestions um, for a first read probably sometime in May, April, May, April meeting, May meeting. Okay. Do they get a combined grade or do they get a grade for each? Well, in most unified arts you get just one grade, but health and gym is, is the special because I believe it's the state that makes them separate those two out. So they I have them both. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So health a is a separate grade. Both. Gym is a separate right. grade. Mm -hmm. so, but only but one. It's only con gotcha. one unified art. Okay. So 
that was my concern. And the other thing is, is um, we had brought up in the past about the weighted grades for AP yeah. versus yeah. dual enrollment. Yeah. Um, has that anything come about or that, conversations on that? That would be part of that grading okay. policy right. because it's, it's you know, kind of weird that we'd have a middle school grading policy right. and not others. Right. So we need one grading policy that incorporates how we grade for elementary, middle, and high mm -hmm. school. All schools. Mm -hmm. You're not so, saying they're and the, and the all waiting, be graded the same. You're no. just saying it's going to be included in that one. Instruction. Okay, correct. Because and are you getting parental input input to that? As yes. always for policies. Absolutely, and and we teacher input as well. And I will segue to that to make a connection to Brad's presentation. We have an elementary attendance policy, a high school. Right. So we want to have one attendance policy, but within that will be elementary, middle, and high school. Okay. So those are two policies that right. we're planning on bringing to you by the spring so that we can implement for the following year. Absolutely. So we have our work cut out for us. Yeah, I, I, and, and not to put fire under you or anything, but you know, <laughs> if, if it would be even better to do it in March due to the fact that we have a first, second read um, for policies, students are still in school, so parents are likely to may pay more attention to yeah. our reading of our policies versus summertime when everybody's mind is on sure. vacation and not what the Board of Ed is really doing. Um, in, in another life where, where Dr. Kane and I had worked on a, on a grading policy, it took the better part of three years. I'm sure. I, I understand that. Yeah. I understand. So, so we want to make sure we're doing a, a thorough job, but we also right. want to make sure that we're getting input and right. that we're not just rushing to make a decision to get it to you that we're... Mm -hmm. you know. Dr. King? And the Parent Advisory Council <coughs> that I'll have will be another forum for that. And I'm oh, going to ask uh, Ms. Walbert to put it in front of the Title I parent uh, group that she has because the, the structure that we have, parents are not, as every time you ask, has there been any comment, there is rarely comment right. on policies. So we've got to do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that was all I had to say. I'm sorry, Mr. Farley. I just wanted to point out that in January, we'll introduce the policy on policies, which changes our process from a three read to a two read process. Oh, okay. And okay. so there may be room in this to accomplish both. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. good news. Good. <clears throat> Satisfied? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to citizen participation, public comment. If anyone out here would like or has anything else to say. Uh, future meetings and events. December 20th, we will be having a budget work session here at, actually, it's not going to be a budget. It's, it's not a, a budget work session. session. It's yeah. going to be a work session. Um, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then our next board meeting will be the second Wednesday of the month, which is January 10th. Then we will have a budget work session on January 17th and a budget work session again on January 31st. And, the, and I think that that is it for the evening. So we would like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and That's we'll see you in January. These Thank you. I make a motion that we close open session. There we go. <laughs> I can't wait. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Aye.